morning, Satan. Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, hopefully the years will return to my lifespan now. <laughs> but it's good to see you. Please help yourself to pastries and coffee.
<clears throat> okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. Good morning and happy Fair Housing Month. My name is Jill Faison and I'm Deputy Commissioner for External Relations here at the New York State Division of Human Rights. And it is my honor to welcome you to talk about fair housing equity uh, through policy practice and education. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping items at the top. Um, you'll see that we have ASL here for anyone that uh, needs the accommodation, as well as if you need any other accommodation, our Director of Disability Rights, John Harrion, is here. Please see him if you need an accommodation. Our restrooms are out to the right through Milltown, which is an exhibit uh, to the right here, uh, and out the double doors. All of the panels today will be in this room, the Huxley Theater. So um, our first panel is the housing update where the agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, will talk to you uh, about new and interesting laws, initiatives uh, that are happening in the housing space. Um, we'll have a um, Fair Housing for Real Estate Professionals panel second, um, and that entails getting a continuing education card if you are a realtor and are looking for credit. So after that second panel, um, NISAR, our sponsor, thank you to NISAR, the New York State Association of Realtors, will be handing out these yellow cards. Please. Um, Fill them out and return them if you are a realtor looking for credit. Um, then we will have lunch right where the um, breakfast was served. And we're really excited to have Umana Yana uh, as our caterer for lunch. Um, that'll be from 1 to 1.40. And then we will come back into the theater for some lunchtime remarks. And then our third panel, which is an impact litigation panel for our lawyers. If you're looking to get CLE credit, you have to sign in, sign out. You know the drill, the affirmation, the, the survey, all of that. Uh, please and thank you. Um, and if you are not interested in the CLE credit, we are simultaneously having a museum tour uh, at 2.30. So um, you have your choice of listening to the impact litigation panel at 2.30 or going on a guided tour of the museum with some fair housing um, additions to that tour. So I think that is everything. If you have any other questions, please feel free uh, to approach myself or Manny Katarum with those questions. And uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to my commissioner, Maria Imperial. Thank you. Good morning, all. Good morning. Buenos dias. So I'm Marie Imperial, and I have the honor of serving as um, the New York State Division of Human Rights Commissioner. And as everyone knows, DHR is the civil rights agency for the state. And we enforce the state's human rights law. And I'm so proud, and I didn't know this before I became the commissioner, actually, that New York was the first state in the country to pass a human rights law, and also the first state in the country to create uh, an agency to enforce the law. First, I want to thank our partners at the New York State Homes and Community Renewal, and also the state, um, the uh, division of state, the state division, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Department of State, lo siento. <laughs> um, you're going to be hearing from Commissioner Visnauskas and also Secretary of State Rodriguez, um, but I want to underscore how grateful we are for your continued partnership. I also want to thank the museum. This is such beautiful space. I think it has such good energy. And I want to thank all of you for coming here today um, and joining us on this very important conference. I, don't, I would be remiss in not recognizing our staff as well. It takes a lot to put on a conference. So I would like to give the staff a round of applause. And I also want to thank the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban um, 
Development for sponsoring this program and also for being our partner and sponsoring our campaign. We launched a campaign in April, uh, Fair Housing Protects, Knowledge Empowers, Increasing Equity Through Policy, Practice, and Education, and we're very grateful for HUD's, for HUD's support. It's been proven time after time and study after study that your health, wealth, and overall achievement can be more accurately predicted by your zip code that you grew up in than any other single factor. The social determinants of health have ver further verified this connection. Where we live matters. And I like to share with people because I think that this is kind of a circle, but I actually work at the State Division of Human Rights and our headquarters are in the Bronx on Fordham Road. Um, and it's actually the zip code of where I grew up, 10458. So it really have come full, full circle. It's truly central to the health and well-being of the people of our state to eliminate housing discrimination and work in steadfast partnership to achieve housing equity. With so many different types of stakeholders in this room, from policymakers and practitioners to community members, housing advocates, and real estate professional, this event is a unique opportunity to learn from each other, and there is so much to discuss. As many of you know, and I mentioned, this month also commemorates the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. This year, it's the 55th anniversary. The Fair Housing Act was and remains one of the most powerful civil rights laws in our country. It's impacted millions of Americans for the better. But we all know there's so much more we need to do. And of course, we're not here just to talk about problems, but we also want to focus on solutions. As I mentioned, the theme of this year's conference is Fair Housing Protects, Knowledge Empowers, Increasing Equity Through Policy, Practice, and Education. We chose this theme not only because it's the title of our new PSA campaign done in partnership with HUD, but we also wanted a theme that was a call to action, an invitation to lift up best practices and an opportunity to spread information because knowledge empowers. Said another way, New York has the strongest fair housing laws on the books. Now it's incumbent on all of us, all the professionals in this room, to make sure that people know their rights and understand what to do if they experience housing discrimination. We have some fantastic panelists here today, and I'd like to thank you in advance for um, agreeing to serve on these panels, and you will be sharing your insight and expertise with us and we also have wonderful featured speakers. Nick Rangel from the Legal Aid Society. I don't think I had the pleasure of meeting him yet. Are you here? Yes. Yeah. Her. Her. Oh, yeah, yay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Brian Green from the National Association of Realtors, and I haven't seen Brian here yet either, who will address the conference during lunch. We look forward to hearing about their work in the battle for fair housing, both here in New York and nationwide. I also look forward to hearing from all of you who are in the field serving the public every day and dealing with housing discrimination in real time. We at DHR want to support you in whatever way we can. Thank you again for your participation today as we learn and grow together as community and in furtherance of fair housing. Thank you so much. I now have the pleasure of introducing Commissioner Visnauskas, who is the Commissioner and CEO of New York State Homes and Community Renewal. In February 2017, Ruth Ann Visnauskas was appointed Commissioner CEO of the New York State Homes and Community Re Renewal, the agency charged with financing the development and preservation of affordable housing statewide. Ruth Ann previously served as HCR's Executive Deputy Commissioner for Housing Development, where she was responsible for strategic leadership and oversight of multifamily housing finance programs, the State of New York Mortgage Agency, known as Sony May, and the Mortgage Insurance Fund, the Office of Community Renewal, and the Office of Faith-Based Community Development Services. Prior to joining HCR, Ruth Ann was Managing Director of the Housing Advisory Board for the Robin Hood Foundation, New York's largest poverty-fighting organization. The Housing Advisory Board was established to fund initiatives to advance the quantity and quality of affordable housing for low-income New Yorkers. Ruth Ann held also several key positions at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, including the role of Commissioner. 
She received her bachelor's degree in urban studies from the University of Pennsylvania and holds a master's degree in urban planning from the Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service at New York University. She doesn't know this, but I wanted to share with, with her that when I was practicing I didn't realize that you had that commissioners have to be confirmed by the Senate. I did not realize that. And when I practiced, I actually watched oh, Caroline remembers. I actually watched your uh, when you did it so that I could learn. So thank you. You are a great teacher. <laughs> Commissioner Visnowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for inviting me to um, speak at this important conference. Um, and I, I would also um, compliment, I love the branding, um, and I, I think there's uh, so much power and sort of the simplicity of messaging that we do around this issue, and so I certainly um, love that. And I'm uh, delighted to be here today. I actually, um, as is uh, sort of happens, I'm sort of always surprised by things that I haven't yet done, and I, I haven't actually been here before, even though I've been in state government for a little while. Um, and it's sort of a delight to stand in that room and sort of close your eyes for a second and maybe feel like you're outside and hear the, I think it's a frog maybe chirping. I don't know what it is exactly. I'm like a little too disconnected from nature to know what sound that actually is, but I think it's a frog. I don't know. Uh, but I'm great to be here. It's also great to be um, with Secretary Rodriguez. We were in Troy a couple of weeks ago um, celebrating a major uh, groundbreaking just across the river, so it's always great to be with you too. Um, and I want to um, thank everyone who's going to be here today um, on the panels. It's such um, important work, and I think having a mix of um, stakeholders uh, to be able to, to talk about our collective efforts to dismantle what have been um, historic and also current roadblocks to housing equity is so important. Um, as we all know, April is National Fair Housing Month, a time uh, dedicated to reminding us of our year-round responsibility to prevent discrimination and enforce the Fair Housing Act. Adopted in 1968 in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, the act marked a milestone in America's slow awakening to the fact that communities of color and other historically marginalized groups really have unequal access to housing of their choice. There are still far too many people, um, uh, there are still far too many deeply set historical barriers that people of color face in looking for a place to put down roots and to grow a family, whether that's in their hometown or in a new place. But to be clear, there should be absolutely no policy, spoken or unspoken, that is designed to dictate how and where New Yorkers choose to live. Fair housing is a law of the land, and that is what today is all about. I want to take a few minutes just to talk about some of the initiatives uh, that we have underway at HCR uh, related to furthering fair housing. We're taking a hard look at the current patterns of housing discrimination. We speak um, and do a lot of outreach to people around the state, uh, mapping living patterns, looking at where housing is funded, and trying to create action items around those issues. You'll hear a lot more today from um, Brooke Davis, who's on the first panel um, and who is uh, one of the um, absolute sort of gems and heroes of HCR uh, in this work, um, and who will talk a little bit more about this work later. Um, but in a couple broad strokes, uh, we operate under a five-year, $25 billion housing plan, and we continue to fund affordable and supportive housing developments across the state that create access to homes in communities where people have been excluded historically, and we try to bring what we certainly see as kind of life-changing resources to neighborhoods that have really experienced um, disinvestment over the last decades. We build inclusion to our programs uh, the developers we work with cannot reject qualified would-be renters based on factors that can have a disproportionate impact on community of colors, immigrants, and domestic violence survivors. So, for example, things like student and medical debt cannot be counted against an applicant. Uh, neither can arrests and conviction records, certainly um, things that we all know do not have uh, effect on the safety of a building or of its residents um, uh, when those things are considered properly uh, and as uh, within the person as a whole. There are two new developments here in the capital region that are good illustrations of these. Um, one is understanding that affordable housing options for the growing workforce in Saratoga Springs. Uh, the city championed a rezoning that was designed to welcome the development of affordable residential housing within a half mile of the core downtown area. 
The result is a project called Tate Lane Reserve, a development with 202 units of affordable family and supportive housing that will help New Yorkers live, work, and thrive in beautiful Saratoga. This development brings needed opportunity to the area because there's a lot of limited, there are limited options, not a lot, there are limited options to accommodate the growing workforce in Saratoga. Families moving the, into the Tate Lane will have access to high-performing schools, to recreational facilities, employment, public transportation, uh, um, all the sort of bundle of goods that are necessary to really have a thriving, uh, growing community. In Schenectady, a project called Hillside Views brought homes and resources to the underserved Hamilton Hill neighborhood. Um, this includes a $14 million Boys and Girls Club. The new location for the Boys and Girls Club allowed that organization to expand their services and triple daily attendance. It's strategically located between Mount Pleasant Middle School and Pleasant Valley Elementary School, and on the border of two neighborhoods, both Mount Pleasant and Hamilton Hill. And as if the fantastic building needed to prove um, its importance even more as a multi-purpose community resource, given the Boys and Girls Club, it opened just in time to become a food distribution hub during COVID. This year, we expanded our fair housing testing pilot program into a full program funding six organizations throughout the state to deploy undercover testers to root out discrimination in housing. Uh, one of our partners, uh, CNY Fair Housing, is here, and they're also going to be presenting on a panel later today. Uh, I'm really excited about that partnership and all the work that we're doing there. Um, and lastly, we're also expanding our Making, our Making Moves program, uh, which is a program where we work with Section 8 voucher holders to uh, overcome obstacles to live in neighborhoods that meet their family needs, neighborhoods of opportunities, well-resourced areas. Um, so we're really excited to be um, expanding that opportunity as well. Um, as these examples demonstrate, confronting, confronting segregation and inequality uh, requires a lot of tools in our toolbox. There's really not one way really to address uh, the issues in housing that we see. Um, I'm really gratified to see this in practice uh, in our partnership with the state agencies that are here today. We really can't do this uh, work alone and, and rely on our um, partner agencies to um, do all the work that we do. So much of the progress we've made and want to make is dependent on knowing the history and also knowing the law. In facing discrimination and working to erase its toxic effects, knowledge and education really go a long way. So I thank you again for being here, um, for listening, for joining the battle to uh, eliminate the red lines and the, all the inequity that we see in our communities each and every day. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Fisnowskis. I now have the pleasure of introducing Robert Rodriguez, who is New York's 68th Secretary of State. Secretary Rodriguez was nominated to the position by Governor Hochul in November of 2021. Mr. Rodriguez is an accomplished leader and former legislator with civic and legislative successes that have been focused strategically on investing in and developing public good infrastructure projects creating good paying jobs and addressing financial disparities for historically underrepresented minorities and low income communities. Secretary Rodriguez has specialized in providing advice to state and local governments and transportation issues in the Northeast and Midwest, focusing on financial planning, credit rating strategy, managing and executing debt issuance transactions, asset liability management and public private partnerships. As a legislator, Secretary Rodriguez served as a member of New York State Assembly for 11 years, representing Assembly District 68. During his time in the Assembly, he focused on protecting and creating affordable housing, bringing good jobs into the community, and ensuring children received a quality education. In the private sector, Secretary Rodriguez served as De Director at Public Financial Management, the leading municipal financial advisor in the nation. Secretary Rodriguez is a graduate of Yale University, where he received a BA in History and Political Science, and NYU Stern Business School, where he received an MBA in Finance. He also was an emerging leader of the New American Alliance and the Council for Urban Professionals Cup Fellow. Secretary Rodriguez. <clears throat>
Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm Secretary Robert Rodriguez. I'm thrilled to be joining my partners in state government, uh, the Division of Human Rights with Maria Imperial Commissioner and uh, Homes and Community Renewal Commissioner Ruth Ann Visnauskas. And it's, uh, it's really delightful to be here talking about such an important issue. And it's important because no matter what, New Yorkers deserve access to fair and equitable housing, free of discrimination. And as a state, we know what's right. And we demand that everyone is treated fairly. And Governor Hochul has been a tireless advocate uh, and champion to make sure that efforts to bring in and usher in a new era of equity and justice for home buyers and renters by promoting transparency and accountability in the housing industry. So at the Department of State, our role is to protect New Yorkers. And we take that role very seriously. As the agency that licenses real estate agents and brokers, we work hard to make sure that it's abundantly clear what the rules are and that there are repercussions when the laws are broken. The state is combating housing discrimination. Uh, we are conducting fair housing testing, as was mentioned, increasing our training and raising the maximum fines for misconduct by real estate brokers and salespersons. Uh, and we do that by collaborating with our agency partners because we all know that we have an obligation in addition um, to the legal responsibility to affirmatively provide fair housing. And we routinely partner with our, uh, with our Division of Human Rights by coordinating on discrimination complaints against real estate agents. And much of this uh, has happened historically uh, due to the redlining issues and the discrimination, uh, but was, we were reminded of this in, by um, Newsday in November 2019 when the Department of State and HCR opened 37 joint investigations into housing discrimination on Long Island. It's a reminder that this is still happening. It's happening out there. It is a real issue um, for us to uh, attend to. And these investigations involved over 80 individuals, including real estate agents, brokers, school instructors, and coordinators doing business on Long Island. And in further response to the Newsday report, the Department of State and DHCR and New York State Homes launched a public education campaign designed to educate New Yorkers about fair housing rights and protections. We established a hotline where individuals can call and file complaints. Uh, and in 2020, we issued new regulations uh, that provide for enhanced disclosure by real estate professionals to ensure that prospective home buyers and renters received information about their rights and their protections under New York State law, as well as requiring continuing education courses to be recorded. Um, so thank you all for those who are coming here to participate in those continuing education classes. But we'd like to point out that the state's efforts to combat uh, housing discrimination certainly come before any news reports and come before 2019. Uh, before 2016, DOS and, H and DHR investigated fair housing complaints independently. And since then, we've streamlined things to do things together, providing for more efficiency and a more timely process uh, for us to deal with uh, issues of potential discrimination by brokers and salespeople. But it's not just the industry that we focus on. What we try to do is make sure that consumers are protected. In the Department of State, we also have our Division of Consumer Protection, where we strive to educate consumers about their rights when they're searching for housing. For example, this month, we released a five-part series on rental and first-time home, first -time home buyer scams and provided tips for individuals who are looking uh, to purchase housing and on how to verify the identity of any real estate professional. We know with so much more, uh, more transactions happening on the internet, unfortunately, there are unscrupulous people who are representing themselves as real estate agents or brokers and or utilizing uh, things like false listings as a means to, um, you know, uh, to take advantage of first time home buyers. So we look to also provide tips for home buyers on how to research and look for credible resources and referrals with regards to lenders, real estate agents, and home inspectors. Uh, but really, as you can see here, it's an all hands on deck approach to making sure that New Yorkers have a safe place to live and call home, but also that the process 
of finding a home and finding and meeting the professionals that help you move into that home uh, uh, is a process that is free of discrimination. So thank you all for having me and thank you for your continued attention to a subject that is critical really to the future and the well-being of New Yorkers in the state of New York. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Rodriguez. So our next uh, panel is going to be our housing update panel. So I would just like to invite our panelists to come forward and our moderator. Into the slides. Is it this guy right here? Is it this guy? Oh, there we are. Forward, backward. And, that, and then when they come up to their PowerPoints, you can just give it to them. Yeah. Or they can come up to the podium. Where are they, where, where are they clicking on to get to this? To the, uh, it's all to get one to the thing. It's all it's one thing. It's all one thing. So the next slide will be Jason's slide on the panel. So okay. Jason hasn't done any slides, so it's just going to stay right there. Okay. Um, for him, same thing with Dave. Oh, there and we go. then okay. this one that starts Brooks. Okay. okay. All right, great. We'll leave it here. So either if you want to stand at the podium because you're mm -hmm. a moderator, she can next slide, or we can hand it off and we can okay. slide ourselves. Okay. This was forward and back, right? Got That's it. what yep. I said. I was asking you. It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try just in case. Okay. Simple enough. Yeah. All right, so we'll just wait for Brooke. And you have like a small version of bios. Of yeah, bios. I'm going to just briefly. Yeah, not gonna... we don't have to go through the long bios. <laughs> yes. Actually, well, I might. I was going to also set up over here to give them like a two-minute sign when uh, they're close to ten minutes each, and then I can advance the slides. I think from the seat too. Okay. Yeah, yeah that works. Yeah. We're just Look waiting for that. What? Hmm? Um. Yeah, you probably should since it's two people. <laughs> I see lunch zero already. Hmm? I see lunch zero already. Yeah. I'm gonna go quickly. Okay. Yeah. You, um, you at the end, so you can. Yeah. No. Um, Rick Amold is the end. No. I switched, I switched oh. it. Yeah. I sent you an email. You did. You're gonna be the final. Yeah. I'm the final. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to 
flip through my slides because the slides are set up. If you come up first, then I'll get you first, and we'll go with Rick last. Yeah, that's 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 how the yeah, slides are oh, okay. organized. Um, but okay. Yeah, so we um, need to end by. That's okay, Rick. Uh, Eleven fifty-five. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, I'm pleased to be moderating our first panel here this morning. My name is John Harrion. I'm the Director of Disability Rights for the New York State Division of Human Rights. Uh, my pleasure to be introducing a terrific uh, group of uh, individuals here who represent a variety of uh, government agencies who are going to be sharing uh, agency updates uh, with all of you here today. Um, to my far right is Jason Chang. Jason is currently uh, the Director of Program Compliance in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at HUD Region 2. Uh, to Jason's left is David Gonzalez. David is the uh, General Counsel for Department of State, is serving as the Acting General Counsel for the New York State Department of State. And to David's left is Rick Umholtz. Rick is the Acting Deputy Commissioner of Housing and Refugee <coughs> Services. And to Rick's left is Brooke Davis. Brooke is the Deputy Counsel for Policy for HCR, and to Brooks' left is Jill Faison, who was Deputy Commissioner for External Relations at the Division of Human Rights. Uh, their full bios are in your materials, and uh, Jason Young is going to be getting us started here. So Jason. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this event. Um, as you've all heard already this morning, April marks the uh, celebration that we have yearly about the, the Fair Housing Month, and this year marks the 55th year since the act has been signed. Um, and while it's been 55 years, the, the Fair Housing Act remains to be a very important tool for HUD, sorry, <laughs> um, important tool for HUD for uh, ensuring that justice and dignity um, exist in our housing system. Now, ending housing discrimination is a priority for HUD, and we are definitely co committed to taking the action to realize the full promise of the Fair Housing Act. So, sorry. Um, suffering from allergies here in upstate, so <laughs> please bear with me. <laughs> um, as I was saying about HUD's commitment, um, today, this morning, I just want to highlight a few of our latest initiative um, that HUD is running uh, currently. Um, and um, in, in, in interest of time and with of all the, uh, the panels that uh, are speaking today, I'll, I'll just hit mainly highlights and then um, open it up for questioning at the end if you all have any questions uh, for uh, further details. Uh, one of the first things I want to highlight is um, HUD's work in terms of expanding uh, definitions within the Fair Housing Act. Um, in 2021, with the uh, Supreme Court case in Bostock, um, kind of redefine um, one of the protective classes uh, that are um, defined within the Fair Housing Act, um, specifically around the basis of sex. Um, there, while the Bostock case was a, a Title VII employment case, uh, the court ruled that protection of sex actually also meant the protection for uh, people uh, under the basis of gender identification or, and um, sexual orientation. It was a, a Title VII um, employment case. Uh, we've adopted it for um, to wait purposes uh, in ensuring that when we're talking about Fair Housing Act protections, we're also extending uh, protections for people for under gender identity, identity as well as sexual orientation. Um, just in February, we announced a uh, notice for uh, proposed rulemaking in the area of uh, the Fair Housing Act's affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, here with the 2023 rule, what we did is we sort of re, um, recodified, uh, reenacted our 2015 rule um, concerning the mandate under the Fair Housing Act to um, ask HUD 
as well as their participants to not only enforce the Fair Housing Act, but to actually proactively act in furtherance of fair housing. Um, what this proposed rule does is kind of streamline what has historically been done already by program participants, um, especially in the area of fair housing planning, fair housing um, policies. Um, but what the new rule does is actually enforces that um, mandate by asking the participants to also include members of the community. And so what that does is um, not only do they uh, require participants to um, <coughs> sorry, um, for participants not only to utilize the, their expertise, uh, but also to include members of the community and for local knowledge uh, to ensure that uh, any strategies that these participants are um, coming up with uh, fit uh, their particular needs within the community. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the public comment period had just ended yesterday. Um, so what HUD is doing now is we'll be um, reviewing those public comments and hopefully within uh, a reasonable amount of time, uh, we will be um, answering those public comments and then hopefully work towards uh, finalizing a rule. Uh, and lastly, what I wanna point out is HUD's work in the area of appraisals. Now, historically, uh, what we've seen in terms of uh, the evidence that we've gathered is that appraisals in the housing um, sector have been, unfortunately, been having discriminatory effect on uh, homeowners of, of colors, uh, specifically uh, appraisals coming in lower than what, ish, what uh, the market um, has shown, um, thus affecting um, their homeowners' um, wealth, so to speak, uh, in, ter in, in their homes, um, and thus um, widening the wealth gap between uh, communities of color uh, and white homeowners. And so what HUD has done is, um, under the leadership of the administration, uh, has led a, uh, a task force uh, led by Secretary Fudge um, to take a look at the industry from within, uh, as well as uh, working with other partners uh, to ensure that uh, appraisers are um, doing the things that they need to do, uh, but having in mind implicit biases, uh, making sure that the industry um, has proper training uh, in those areas, as well as uh, self-policing um, their actions. And that has yielded uh, some action plans that the HUD has uh, implemented, uh, including additional education within the uh, appraisal uh, community, as well as educating uh, members of the public as far as uh, instances uh, which they should be looking out for. So uh, with that, I just want to end my current remarks this morning, and then I'll be happy to take questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much Jason. Uh, our next presenter is Brooke Davis. Uh, Brooke is Deputy Counsel for Policy for HCR. Brooke, I believe you have slides, right? I do have some slides. Uh, yep, start there. Yep. <laughs> there right here. There we go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Fair Housing Month. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good way to start. Uh, housing is more than just the roof over our heads and where we sleep. Where we live is tied to where our children go to school, to meet times to work, Health, out, health outcomes and ability to amass intergenerational wealth through home ownership. When we talk about fair housing and throughout the course of the day, we're talking about removing barriers to housing access. We are not just talking about the roof over our heads, but all of these things. Often when we talk about fair housing and segregation, the focus is on individual prejudice by landlords, real estate agents, and brokers the intentional acts of government that help to create and exacerbate segregation is often ignored. I'm going to give a little bit of history, if you could just bear with me for a few minutes. Um, it's important to know where we have been to know where we need to go. 
History textbooks talk about the New Deal and the creation of federal loan programs that increase home ownership but fails to discuss redlining and its legacy. If you don't mind going there, mm -hmm. uh, thanks. In 1934, the Federal Housing Administration was founded. It was kind of like the precursor to HUD. It operated through the New Deal's National Housing Act and promoted home ownership by guaranteeing mortgages. Its affiliate agency, Home Owners Loan Corporation, developed color-coded color -coded maps ranking the loan's worthiness and risk in over 200 cities and towns across the United States including most cities in New York State. Neighborhoods were ranked from A to D grade, with D being determined to be most at risk. D neighborhoods were literally ranked in red on the map. Hence the term redlining. The, the areas that were in red was often due to having a concentration of people of color. Residents in these neighborhoods were unable to get home loans backed by federal guarantees and ultimately mortgages. Entire neighborhoods were shut out of being able to purchase our home and being able to mass intergenerational wealth. The red line maps for Syracuse, Rochester, and Albany are behind me on the screen. See it there. The red, li red lining laid the groundwork for some of the racial disparities that exist today. A recent study was conducted in Rochester looking at life expectancy rates in various communities. Thank you. Switch to the next slide. Thank you. Areas that were redlined in the 1930s currently have a five-year lower life expectancy rate than other surrounding areas, and four out of the five zip codes in Monroe County, hardest hit by COVID, were in previously red line areas. Here on the map, you're able to see the red line, and then the areas in the dark brown are the areas that were um, hardest hit by COVID, and you're able to see the correlation. Go to the next slide. MetLife Insurance Company developed Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village in the 1940s. MetLife Insurance Company at that time insured one third of New York City's households and realizing the correlation between substandard housing and mortality rates, decided to invest in housing. The 18 blocks where Stytown and Peter Cooper Village now stand was once known as the gas house area. Does anyone here have ever heard of the gas house area? I grew up in New York City my whole life and never heard of the gas house area. Um, the area was an integrated and stable community of African Americans, Latinos, Irish, and Eastern European immigrants. The city deemed the area as blighted and provided MetLife with a 25-year tax abatement in order to develop um, Stytown and Peter Cooper Village. The city did so even though MetLife stated publicly and had a well-known policy that the development would only be rented to white families. 40% of the families that were evicted from the 18-block gas house district were African-American and Puerto Ricans. They were unable to move into both Peter Cooper Village and Stytown. MetLife facing a backlash for its discriminatory policy at Stytown, and it should be known at the time, two million of its policyholders were black, entered into a contract with the city and built the Riverton housing in Harlem for black families. These are just a few examples of the intentional governmental acts that exacerbated segregation. It is only through intentional acts that we can remedy. I just want to touch upon a few things that HCR is doing to further fair housing. I'm not going to give the whole laundry list, just some highlights. Go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The Federal Housing Choice Voucher Program, commonly known as Section 8, provides low income households with a rental subsidy to enable access to quality homes on the private market in neighborhoods that people can choose. Although the Section 8 program has been widely successful in increasing access to stable housing and reducing financial burdens, 
Uh, research has shown that families with vouchers continue to live in areas of concentrated poverty. Housing mobility programs help families that receive Section 8 overcome barriers to moving to well-resourced neighborhoods if they choose to do so. In doing so, this helps expand access to economic mobility, well-performing schools, and job opportunities. Recent social science research has shown that mobility programs lead to improve health, education, and income outcomes for low-income children who move to lower poverty areas. Mobility programs also have a dramatic impact on the type of neighborhoods where low-income families choose to live. HCR currently funds programs in Long Island, Westchester, and Buffalo area. If you don't mind, go to the next slide, thanks. HUD currently provides direct funding for mobility programs in Rochester and New York City. HCR, working in partnership with enterprise community partners, released a request for proposals to expand the mobility program to other areas of the state. HCR is making up to 10 million in funding available to further this expansion. In the past few years, we enacted progressive tenant selection policies for HCR. Thank you. Policies that strictly look at credit or justice involvement histories can have a disproportionate impact on people of color, people with disabilities, uh, and domestic violence survivors. All applicants for HCR-funded housing must be individually assessed according to HCR guidelines. Certain factors cannot be used to deny access to housing, such as delinquencies on student, on student or medical debt, negative credit if the applicant can show that they have paid 12 months of on-time rent, or crimes that do not affect safety. For example, prior to our policy, a person could have been denied access to our housing for a shoplifting offense that occurred many years ago. These policies open up housing opportunities for New Yorkers that would have been barred due to factors unrelated to whether they pay their rent or pose a threat to the health and safety of other residents. Um, we contracted with six fair housing organizations to conduct fair housing testing in areas across the state. Often, fair housing violation occurs, what we say, with a smile and a handshake. A person does not know if the apartment was uh, rented five minutes ago, like they were told, or because they were black or lesbian or some other protected class. Uh, fair housing testing organizations send out testers who are similar in all aspects, uh, except for the protected class, um, to see if they are treated the same when they go and try to rent or buy an apartment. Last year, uh, 2.2 million was provided for the testing organizations. Uh, we'll see how much is budgeted for this year. And lastly, I want to talk about our um, affirmatively further fair housing report. Um, I just want to note that the Fair Housing Act also provides that for states and municipalities that receive HUD funding, they must do more than just not discriminate but must also affirmatively further fair housing. That is, they must take steps to address racial disparities in housing and segregation. This is really um, an acknowledgement of what we talked about earlier and all of that history and the government um, helping to exacerbate um, fair housing issues. Um, New York State completed its assessment of fair housing report uh, which is about 200 and 250 pages, uh, which includes an analysis of hard data, statistics, as well as qualitative data, and um, was used, had a lot of input from all kind of impacted parties and individuals across the state. And I would be um, highly remiss if I did not uh, do a huge shout out and thank you to my team that's sitting in the back. Uh, Nadia Salcedo, Dan Krakow, Stephen Abrams-Downey, and Janae Gaskin for um, 
all this really amazing work that went into this report. Uh, the report uh, really identifies the barriers to fair housing and housing access and provides um, a roadmap and some meaningful actions uh, that we are able to take to be able to address these barriers. Um, the AFFH report is up on HCR's website. Um, please, please, please take a look at it and provide feedback. People have until June 8th to do so. Um, you really help us create the mode, uh, roadmap going forward into doing what we need to do um, and our plan to address uh, fair housing concerns. Um, yes, thanks. Um, I think we're all of us in this room that do some type of civil rights work um, and work on behalf of the people of the state of New York are somewhat optimistic. When I first started practicing law, and I'm not that old despite what some of my staff tell me, um, I was able to be evicted from my apartment for being a lesbian. Uh, three years thereafter, my rights were protected in New York State. And I will now also say that I'm able to be married to my spouse and file taxes uh, jointly. So progress <laughs> is, is made, right? So I will say that James Baldwin summed up the AFH process and all the work that needs to be done to further fair housing when he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. I am confident that working together, we can create the change that we need. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Brooke. Appreciate that. Um, our next panelist is David Gonzalez. David is the acting general counsel for the New York State Department of State. Do you have slides, David, or? Don't. No. Okay. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Um, so just to pick up uh, where Secretary Rodriguez left off with uh, within the Department of State, the Department of State has a very diverse port program portfolio, um, and that portfolio intersects with uh, fair housing on two fronts. Um, through By and through the Division of Consumer Protection, um, the Consumer Protection Division provides education to, to consumers, home buyers, and renters about real estate uh, frauds and scams. Um, but the Department of State also has a licensing division um, by which 35 occupations in the state of New York are licensed. Two of those occupations are real estate professionals, uh, real estate brokers and real estate salespersons. And as you can imagine, and many of you in the room know, um, real estate professionals uh, play a very important role in the provision of fair housing services in the state of New York. Um, what I'm going to review over the next few minutes are some recent changes in law. Um, regarding fair housing and how that intersects with uh, the real estate practice. So in, in the prior two legislative sessions in 2021 and 2022, um, there were a suite of bills that were passed by the legislature and then they were, um, it was, the, the laws were, the legislation was a product of a, of a joint effort between the legislature and the governor. Um, so the backbone of those laws was passed in 2021 and in 2022, uh, there were revisions that reflected um, the, the intent and the work of, uh, of both sides of government. And those laws did a number of things to, um, to enhance fair housing protection in the state of New York. Um, so at the outset, um, if, if one wants to be licensed as a real estate professional, uh, there are qualifications as there would be with any other license. So one of these new laws increased the required coursework that a prospective licensee would have to engage in in order to get a real estate license. Um, so the, uh, the base hours, I believe, were 120, and they went up to about 155, if I remember my numbers correctly. Um, but baked into that increase in the, uh, in the minimum training required for obtaining a license was a specific requirement that that training include rules applicable to fair housing and discrimination in the sale and rental of real property uh, or an interest affecting real property. Um, a similar, uh, a couple of similar laws uh, went into effect relating to training requirements and they addressed specifically 
renewals of license. So under existing law, um, licensed professionals, they're licensed for a term, and when they're up for renewal, if they wish to, uh, to get renewed, they have to, as many of you know, they have to uh, get uh, certain continuing education requirements. There's a set number of hours. So one of these new laws um, created a requirement that um, the 22 and a half hours that are applicable to, to certifying or obtaining a renewal license as a salesperson or as a broker include um, coursework in cultural competency. And another law um, added a requirement that um, the training applicable to uh, providing a foundation for a renewal also include implicit bias training. Another law that was passed uh, with that suite of laws um, created uh, a new, spe what's called a special revenue fund. A special revenue fund is a dedicated fund in, in the state finance law um, <clears throat> that's sourced by whatever the law says it's, it's, it, that it's funded by, and then it's, it's specifically used for the purpose uh, for which it's created. So um, in this suite of laws, there was a special fund call created called an anti-discrimination in housing fund. And uh, under that law, that fund is uh, controlled by the comptroller, and it is, uh, it's fed by settlements uh, for that, from cases that the attorney general uh, might bring. Uh, but it's also funded by a couple of uh, intersecting points with uh, the Department of State's licensing program. So now when folks apply for a real estate broker's uh, license, there is a surcharge, and the surcharge goes into this anti-discrimination and housing fund automatically. Um, and the same thing for a salesperson. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, that law increased the maximum fine that's applicable um, to real estate professionals for misconduct. So under existing law, um, a licensed professional has to follow rules. Um, if they don't follow those rules, the licensing agency can bring an enforcement action uh, by which a fine, suspension of the license, or revocation of the license is sought. So under this change in law, 50% of the fines that are imposed for uh, violations against real estate professionals are directed into the anti-discrimination in housing fund. Another law that was passed in this suite of laws um, required action on behalf of real estate brokers. Um, this law required um, real estate brokers to develop standardized operating procedures um, that uh, would provide for prerequisites for pr prospective home buyers that they must meet in order to provide broker services. So this change in law required um, the brokers to develop these procedures and post them on their websites. And uh, that's since that has happened, it's been about a year, um, the Department of State is aware of several dozen brokers having their websites updated to reflect the standard operating procedures. Okay, I think I covered everything. That's all the changes in law. Um, if anybody has any questions about the Department of State's role with respect to real estate professionals or the changes in law, I'll take those questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, David. Very much appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, our next presenter is Jill Faison. Rick, we're going to have you after Jill. Okay. Uh, Deputy Commissioner for External Relations at the New York State Division of Human Rights. All right. Can you have okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I think we're almost at afternoon. Um, this is um, a clip from our new partnership with HUD. It is our newest digital ad campaign. And some of you may have seen one of our other images on 787. We've got a big billboard. We're also in Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse. So keep your eyes out for the billboards out there. I love this. Where is she? She might be in Schenectady. She might be in Brooklyn. You never know. But. Um, you know, this is uh, a message that people need to understand is that they have the right to be free of discrimination in their housing. And the landlord can't say they don't rent to people like me. So um, we're really trying to get the word out. And this is our new campaign. So next slide, please. 
So, you know, our commissioner talked a little bit about what the New York State Division of Human Rights is, but it is, as the external relations team constantly drives home, our mission to also let people know who we are, right? So uh, the mission of our agency, we're dedicated to eliminating discrimination, remedying injustice, promoting equal opportunity and access and dignity through enforcement of the human rights law. And our vision is a New York free of discrimination where everyone can fully uh, participate to their fullest potential. And how do we do this? Well, we investigate and prosecute and adjudicate discrimination cases. So you can file a claim with our agency alleging discrimination and uh, we will investigate, prosecute and adjudicate that case. Uh, we also do um, carry out our mission by educating the public right here and now uh, about their rights and responsibilities, proposing policy and legislation. You've heard a lot about legislation here. You're about to hear a little bit more. Um, and we also do our best uh, to build community and um, empower people. Um, so our major areas of jurisdiction, as you can see, their employment, housing, uh, what we're here to talk about today, places of public accommodation, like a restaurant or a theater, and then all of the non-religious schools, uh, both public and private, colleges, universities, and credit, which comes into play when you're talking about mortgages and lending. So we have many protected classes, and some of the updates that I'm providing this morning are about additional um, protected classes that were added to the list. We have quite a few here. Um, you can see sexual orientation, gender identity, race, color, national origin, creed, also known as religion, sex, source of income, age, disability, uh, marital status, familial status, military status, predisposing gender, uh, genetic characteristics. This also um, is affiliated with the Crown Act, where um, hairstyles traditionally associated with race are also protected. Uh, favorably resolved arrest records. So I want to give a shout out to HCR. We have a uh, digital campaign around arrest and conviction protections in housing. If you have an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, if you have sealed records, if you have a YO status, you cannot be discriminated against in your housing. They cannot ask you about arrests on the housing application. So that is a big, big campaign that we are working on um, with our partners at Homes and Community Renewal. Um, Pregnancy-related uh, conditions, not convictions. <laughs> That's related to your children, I have a teenager. Um, and retaliation, and I always underscore retaliation because those cases are oftentimes stronger than, uh, or easier to prove than the underlying discrimination case. So our first addition to the newly protected classes is citizenship and immigration status. So that was um, effective uh, December 2022 that a person cannot be discriminated against because of their citizenship or lack thereof or whatever their immigration status might be, undocumented immigrant is a status. So previously, we would get to this under national origin. Um, if someone was discriminating against um, you based on your, your country of origin, however, someone might say, well, I'm not discriminating against you um, because you're from Venezuela. I'm discriminating against you because you are undocumented. So that would have been perhaps a loophole uh, before and no longer, right? Because your citizenship uh, and immigration status is protected. Um, the second protected class that was added, effective May 13th of 2022, is uh, domestic violence victim or survivor status. Um, previously, this class was protected under employment only, and um, then the uh, entire suite of our jurisdiction was extended to uh, domestic violence survivors uh, to be protected. Um, this 
comes up when people are asking about police calls to the house or um, you know damage uh, to a, a prior um, rental uh, circumstance. If that is a associated with someone's status as a domestic violence survivor, they cannot be discriminated against as a basis. So those are the two protected classes that are new uh, to the human rights law. So just, oh, yeah. One more. yeah, okay. So just an overview of what the human rights law covers in the area of housing. It's both private and public housing, rentals, co-ops, condos, um, single family homes uh, in terms of sales, the um, one or two family homes that are owner occupied are um, an exception to our jurisdiction. However, um, if you are advertising a discriminatory manner um, for your owner occupied unit, that is not protected. Uh, you are engaging in discrimination. Uh, excluded from coverage is also um, room rentals uh, for individuals of the same sex. Um, so that is an overview of what we cover under the human rights law and housing. Next slide. Um, okay, so who is covered? Who is, you know, um, prohibited from discriminating? Basically everyone, so anyone who has the right to lease, rent, sell, uh, or have control over who occupies a property um, is covered by uh, the human rights law. So we have a very broad net that we're able to cast over uh, the housing industry, generally speaking. And I think that brings us to our new notice requirements. Oh, obviously. What is prohibited up here is refusing to sell, rent, lease, discriminating in the terms and conditions. You'll hear more about this later. Um, but I wanted to just give a, a general overview of you know, what is prohibited. Uh, I talked about advertisements um, signifying any discriminatory preference um, in the advertisement. That's, that's all prohibited under the human rights law. Okay, so now we're at the new notice requirements. I threw my slides in the air twice earlier this morning, so <laughs> I've been trying to put them together ever since. Let's see, we got lawful source of income and reasonable accommodation. Okay, so this one's a little bit farther back uh, in May of 2022. Um, it was effective 30 days from then and uh, 30 days from whenever a person is renting uh, or um, occupying a home or apartment. So a owner, lessee, sub lessee, assignee, managing agent has to give a disclosure and we have this specific notice on our website, it's translated, it is readily available uh, to make sure that tenants or prospective tenants know their right to request a reasonable modification. Uh, to their to their home uh, or apartment. So that has to do with individuals with disabilities that need a reasonable modification to access uh, and use their home just like anybody else would be able to. There is um, now this requirement that um, the uh, landlords, owners, less, uh, lessors have to give this notice to, uh, to their tenants. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And, you know, we talk about knowledge and powers. People need to understand what their rights are. And so this notice will um, accomplish that. And then our second notice requirement, keeping in the knowledge is power theme, uh, is about source of income. And that was effective in August of 2022, that housing providers and people um, that administer housing assistance um, have to give a notice that source of income discrimination is against the human rights law and how to file a claim if they experience source of income discrimination. And quickly, uh, source of income discrimination is when a landlord or other housing provider discriminates against you based on how you plan to pay your rent, um, whether it's SSI, SSD, uh, public assistance, Section 8, FEPS, 
um, any of those programs and you know child support is also a lawful source of income um, you cannot be discriminated against you used to see no DSS no section 8 in the postings for housing all the time but that um, beginning in 2019 um, is against the human rights law. So um, we have this notice that is going out to all recipients uh, and applicants for housing assistance and making sure that they know source of income discrimination is against the law and how to file a complaint with the division. So I believe that is my presentation. This is what I already said, <laughs> all the different forms. Uh, here's our information on filing a complaint. You go to our website. We also have a fully digital um, complaint form at this point. You can print it if you want to. You want to be old school, fill it out, no problem. But we do have a digital process um, that you can do right with your um, phone or computer. And one year from the date of discrimination, the only exception is three years if you're experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace. That is not what we are talking about today, but I always, you know, make sure people understand three years for sex harassment in the workplace, one year for everything else. Um, and that's that, maybe. What's my <laughs> All right, and that is one of our other images um, for our digital campaign with HUD. Um, and that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jill. Um, our next presenter is Rick Umholtz. Rick is the Acting Deputy Commissioner of Housing and Refugee Services for the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance here in New York. Rich, you, uh, Rick, you have slides, right? So I'll move them through. I'm actually going to change things up and okay. abandon my slides. Okay. Um, I'm in the um, inevitable, inevitable place of understanding two things. I stand between you and lunch. <laughs> One more panel, my friend. <laughs> One oh, one more, more panel. panel. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I'm also the last speaker, so I either have to be dynamic or brief. I'm going to go with my strengths and be brief. So um, housing, the, the, the landscape around housing has dramatically changed, right? Um, since the pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of housing that has been lost. Um, from a number of different fronts. There are landlords out there that are um, choosing to rent to college students instead of vulnerable households or households that have um, less income. Um, there's been landlords that have stopped renting a as a whole. And we hear this from our communities over and over and over again that the housing stock continues to um, shrink and housing options are, are um, far and few in between, particularly affordable. So um, within OTDA, I, I'm the Acting Deputy Commissioner for Housing and Refugee Services, and I think the key takeaway from my remarks is if you're working with um, community partners or if you know folks that want to get in the housing uh, market to expand housing, the, the takeaway is to contact us. We have a suite, I, I, I love the, the word suite, of different funding opportunities to expand housing. And I'm just gonna highlight a few uh, in my remarks today. Um, not too, too deep in, in terms of the dive, but uh, just the, the different types of campa campaigns that we have. So starting on the prevention front, uh, two years ago, uh, the governor appropriated um, in, in an unprecedented way uh, legal services funding, uh, specifically to combat um, evictions and discrimination, and, and we're proud um, to partner with six agencies, primarily focused outside of New York City at this at this time. Uh, six agencies that then in turn subcontract, and there are now legal services in every county outside of New York. City um, funded through this program. New York City itself funds some of the free legal services. So that's that's a primary means by which um, tenants can access representation um, and engage with preservation uh, of housing. Um, one of our flagship programs that's been around and in existence on the capital front 
um, since 1983, I believe, is the Homeless Housing Assistance Program. It's a resource that we partner with many not-for-profits who are the fabric of communities to bring housing solutions um, to, to neighborhoods. And I think we're in every county um, in terms of that program, we partner largely with not-for-profits, but we also can partner with municipalities. Uh, the uh, Homeless Housing Assistance Program is uh, unique in terms of how the procurement works. Uh, about 12 years ago, we moved to an open procurement so that applicants can seek funding and resources through us, um, meeting them where they are. Um, so it's not once a year funding opportunity or twice a year. We continually accept applications. And in terms of the type of supportive housing that we develop under HJP, um, the bottom line is we're, we're, we're addressing homelessness. Um, and I think we've developed funding for every subpopulation uh, that you can name. And um, what I think is also unique about the Homeless Housing Assistance Program is we develop all types of housing in terms of dwellings, right? Um, so we've done everything from single family dwellings on Long Island to being partners with, with HCR on some of the larger developments throughout New York State. So um, it is a unique opportunity bringing resources to our communities. Um, some of the other programs that, that we have in, in our portfolio blend services uh, with uh, housing vouchers. So we have a number of different programs that um, the, the voucher is kind of portable, and then there's a service package component with it that can mitigate um, with landlords and also help um, uh, make housing options available. Many of our not-for-profit communities work with landlord groups to try to engage them and educate them um, around the programs and the need uh, to expand housing to, to vulnerable um, households. So uh, specifically, we have programs that, that focus on uh, a homeless population uh, being the, 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 um, the focus. And we also have other um, programs that, that focus on refugee resettlement activities, again, kind of through, throughout, um, all throughout New York. Um, in terms of OTDA specific actions on, on ensuring furthering uh, of fair housing, um, all of our programs we, we monitor on a regular basis, and one of our practices are to ensure that our, our partners um, are, are good standing partners in, in the first instance, but in the second instance that their own practices are um, furthering fair housing opportunities and ensuring protections for, for the tenants that they serve. Um, just trying to see if there's any other thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, being a former teacher in, in one of my careers, uh, I recall that um, the first thing I said and the last thing I said are usually recalled. So um, the first thing I said was contact us if you're interested in funding. And the last thing I'll say is um, contact us if you're interested in funding, right? Um, I, we're happy to have a, a deep dive and I'm, I'm proud of our team. One of the things that, that we do regularly is we come out to communities to listen to what the needs are. Um, we work with uh, continuums of care in terms of our, our strategic partners with, with HUD. Um, we work with units of local government, citizens. Um, we're happy to come out, hear a need, and try to navigate the funding streams, not only ours, but uh, our, our colleagues across the state, to try to bring new resources and address challenges that communities are facing. So uh, we welcome those opportunities, uh, whether it's you know, here in Albany or you know, Yates County, Hamilton, New York City, we're, we're happy to send a team and um, try to put a plan together. So I'll leave it out there. Great, thanks so much, Rick. So we're right at time, but if someone has a burning question for the agencies. Higher rents that 
So I would toss that one over to our just. So yeah, you've definitely went through the laundry list of issues that people with disabilities face with relationship to housing. Uh, we're gonna have a panel this afternoon where I'm gonna talk about reasonable accommodation issues for people with disabilities in housing. And I'm also happy to connect with you individually to talk about some of those uh, examples um, that, you're, that you've experienced. Okay. Okay. All right, final one in the back. Well, I would say it's hard to make very large, broad brush, you know, um, assessments on, a, you know, a hypothetical like this. But don't be afraid to file a complaint with the Division of Human Rights if you feel that you've been discriminated against based on, you know, your membership or perceived membership in a protected class. Um, you should file with our with our agency. Right. Sure. So the Attorney General's office is not on this panel. They are actually going to be on a panel later on today. Um, but I, you know, I do encourage you to call us, visit our website, um, and you know, talk to us more about what, what you're seeing. So that that's the that's the panel for now. We're at time uh, for this one, but we have so much more discussion. Uh, for the for the rest of the day both on the next panel, which is the fair housing for real estate uh, Agents and professionals as well as our impact litigation uh, panel after lunch, so I want to thank our panelists and you. Yep, that's okay thank you for moderator job. <laughs> yep, We're gonna switch Stan? Where would you like to put us? Right here is fine? Okay.
We were, we're just going to be a we, conversation. We're not trying to do that. Perfect. Even better. That's what I've heard. <laughs> Your papers in order? No, <laughs> I'm just winging it. Oh, what's yeah, what's me too. <laughs> Are you doing something up here tomorrow? Oh, I'm. Yeah, no, I was just going to talk to the self. The only thing I got to read or look at is the segregation, the history. Okay. But otherwise, yeah. everything else. Then we'll go to the other. Oh, I will just. Yeah, I was just looking for you. Yeah, I will ask. How's your vacation? Okay, thank you. Bye bye. saying something good, uh, oh we're in the afternoon good afternoon good afternoon, good afternoon. I go ahead and get started uh, my name is Cicely Harris I am the first deputy commissioner here at DHR welcome to our fair housing summit protects knowledge and empowers um, as you can see our theme this uh, time is equity, right? Um, so moving beyond equality and moving to equity, very important. Looking at and in uh, people in the space that they are and giving them the resources to rise up. So the good thing about this panel, it is for CE credit. Uh, woo! Yes. Make sure you fill out the proper card. I saw them uh, handing them out, so we want to go ahead and move on, but please get that CE credit. Um, and another wonderful thing that we have are the panelists here today. So we're going to have a, a conversation, right, um, about uh, with, the, with you professionals, the real estate professionals. Joining us today, uh, really quickly, Caroline Downey, General Counsel for New York State Division of Human Rights, and Dorothy Botso, real estate professional and trainer uh, at Dorothy Jensen Realty. We uh, had a third panelist, Sally Santangelo, from the executive director of Central of New York Fair Housing. We wish her well. She's not feeling well and not able to join us today, but we do wish her well. Um, I'd like to go ahead and get started with Caroline uh, telling us a little bit about the law. Caroline? Sure, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, so we did have, we were going to have more of a conversation uh, in, in that we had an, a, an advocacy organization representative here whom we don't have today. So I thought, well, I can talk either really slowly, yeah. fill in the time, which I considered, but no. Uh, I, I'm going to go more in, a little more into depth with some of the things that, that Jill mentioned this morning and so important to real estate. Um, 
uh, professionals, and I, I want to thank the real estate professionals because I, I think of, is that coming across okay? It's not a little funny to you? Um, I, I really think of your role as complementing ours, or ours as complementing yours, and in many ways you were the eyes and ears and the first line of defense in enforcing the kinds of laws that we enforce here. Because, uh, you know, you, you have to be licensed, and you have rules, and uh, even if we assume everyone is good-hearted, uh, and we don't assume that, by the way, at the Division of Human Rights, uh, housing providers don't have to be licensed and don't have to follow rules. I mean, they do have to follow rules, but not to be licensed. And your role is different, and it's really important. I speak a lot to realtors. I've spoken at NYSAR many times. And it, I think that's an important part of, of what we do, because it is really... Uh, uh, you're, you're out there as part of uh, what we do in, in enforcement of the human rights law. Uh, Jill went over some of it. It is, you know, it's an amazing law. It, it has such depth. I want to talk a few minutes about what we do procedurally because I think that informs how we uh, look at the law and, and how we um, in, invest in how we in, enforce it. So we are both an investigatory and an adjudicatory agency. And Commissioner Imperial, who unfortunately had to leave, is our adjudicator. So she has all the authority and responsibility of a judge in a state Supreme Court. And the cases that are brought to us are heard administratively, uh, and she is the uh, decider, as the word used to be. Uh, and that's a really important aspect of what we do, because how we look at the law is, uh, is part of the, our role in enforcing the law. And uh, we can give the kinds of remedies that can be had in court under the human rights law, including up to a $100,000 fine, a civil fine for violating the law. And this applies to real estate professionals, housing providers, and anybody covered by our law. Uh, the, the, uh, the Department of State imposes fines too, we understand that. Ours go up to $100,000 plus what other, whatever other kinds of damages there might be and other kinds of remedies in housing. So one of the, one of the important changes to our law in uh, 2019 was an enhancement of what a, a section of our law, section 300, which is called the liberal construction statute. And it tells the, how the human rights law is to be enforced. And it is, it is very specific and it was broadened. We've always had this statute, um, but it was broadened in 2019. And I think it's very important to think of when we think of source of income, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and how the division will be looking at it. And we are guided by the principles of what is in our liberal construction statute. And it's quite specific about what liberal construction means. And it, this is all in your materials, by the way. I'm not, I'm not going to go through a PowerPoint because we were going to have more of a conversation, but the, it, this is all in your materials. But it's important to look at the statute because there are really important aspects. of. So it, it's, um, it's one that is in the right, the, it, uh, the, the statute itself says that, it, that it's a remedial statute that, uh, and that we do not have to, although we have to meet the standards of any federal requirement, we can go beyond those federal standards, and that any exemptions or exceptions are to be narrowly construed. And, and uh, the example of given uh, in, in the court cases on this is uh, where uh, that, it's, uh, that a liberal construction is to be applied in a remedial statute, which the human rights law is, tend to remedy wrongs, uh, in, in the interest of those whose rights are to be protected so that if something is not in the literal meaning of the statute or in the literal words of the statute, it will still be interpreted as being within the statute uh, where it, it, where it uh, furthers the purposes of that law. And I think one of the best ways to look at that is in the context of source of income. Now, Jill went over you know, briefly what the basics of source of income are, uh, and we know what is covered, and, and you know, it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a definition that is called, you know, including but not limited to, so it really is any kind of non-wage kind of income. Uh, and we think of it largely, uh, you know, from a housing standpoint, it's it certainly most of our cases, 
uh, are in the nature of, of Section 8 or other kinds of uh, covered uh, you know, uh, subsid subsidies. Um, and the, the questions that come up, we certainly know that there can be no discrimination in, you know, when we first got this law, we had a lot of cases where landlords and agents would just say no Section 8. Well, you know, that was figured out pretty readily. Those were easy cases for us, you know, done <laughs> uh, finding of discrimination. Uh, but of course, they've got uh, the, uh, the, uh, applic the resistance to accepting people's source of income has become, uh, you know, uh, more subtle. And we have to look more closely at, at, what, at what people are actually doing. And so we certainly know that you, there can't be any differences in how terms, conditions, privileges of housing are provided. Uh, but then we also uh, you know, know that any kinds of um, benefits that come with housing also have to be made available to uh, people who have a subsidized income or a Section 8 voucher or that any kind of, um, um, the, uh, that the uh, manner in which realtors or others treat, um, <laughs> I like it, I like it. <laughs> Morning dawns. Uh, how landlords treat applicants can't be any different. And you know, we've seen many examples of uh, people, well, you know, since we're no longer saying, no, we don't take that. Well, some people are still saying that or, or uh, inadvertently saying it. Uh, but there are other ways of, of making sure that people with applications aren't treated the same way, ignoring them, for example, or in the parlance, ghosting them uh, as, as ways that people can, uh, that realtors can avoid dealing with people uh, with Section 8. We know that the law specifically has been interpreted as uh, recognizing that there are administrative burdens in, apply, in, in accepting, say, Section 8 as an example. There are administrative burdens to that. The fact that there are administrative burdens does not relieve a housing provider or a realtor from accepting those kinds of applicants equally. Uh, and and that, that has a discriminatory impact on people who say have a Section 8 voucher, then that is going to be considered a, uh, a discriminatory. It's, it's, it's a separate kind of theory of discrimination, but it's a well-recognized, long-standing theory of discrimination that a neutral policy that has a discriminatory impact uh, will be considered discrimination. Intent is immaterial, in other words. Uh, and the fact that it applies to everybody, if it has, again, going back to my favorite section 300, if it has that discriminatory impact, then that will be considered within the remedial intention of the statute and therefore will be uh, considered uh, discrimination under the law. Uh, credit history is another example in which, um, and, and we know at, the at, uh, at, at HCR, uh, credit history is, is limited uh, for its um, applicants. Uh, on, a, on a statewide basis, there, it, it, again, the law doesn't address this, it doesn't speak specifically, but a credit history or a credit report that is going to limit people's ability to use their vouchers is going to be looked at very closely as to what the purpose and need for this credit history is. So we know credit history can show a lot of things. It may not show, and does not show, uh, at whether you've paid your rent in the past, right? And so, and of course, you know, with vouchered uh, tenants or potential vouchered tenants, the whole issue of paying the rent is going to be solved for the landlord, right? I bring us more. And we want to be able to address these kinds of subtle changes uh, in the law that um, we're, are uh, the subtle changes that uh, landlords and, and realtors are, are coming up with to avoid having this kind of uh, uh, subsidized uh, situation to deal with, subsidized tenancy. Um, I, I know we'll have some questions on this as we come later, but I did want to cover just a few other uh, areas of the law, again, that, if, that are new-ish some quite new, and, and Jill mentioned uh, them, but I want to go into a little more detail. The arrest provisions under the human rights law, it's in section 296.16 of the human rights law, are very broad and uh, absolute. So 
a landlord or a housing provider or a realtor cannot ask, cannot ask about arrests that have been resolved in an individual's favor, about any, uh, a youthful offender status, about adjournments uh, in contemplation of dismissal. So these are pending arrests where there is an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, and this includes the time period awaiting the dismissal. And very important, sealed records. And I'm not gonna go into the specifics, it's, it's in the law what particular sealed records are um, prohibited from, from um, uh, inquiry. But it is very broad, and it may be getting broader. Uh, there's legislation. There, not, not, uh, nothing has, has passed yet, but this is something that's really important for realtors to think about uh, when they address issues of, of any kind of, of prior judicial uh, uh, justice intervention in the past. So it, it, in, in the legislature thinks so much of this that when they passed uh, the, the legislation, they added a phrase, and, and we used to get questions about this all the time, what if they ask on an application, and I know that I'm covered, but I don't want to be accused of lying on my application because being untruthful on an application is of itself a basis for denying tenancy or employment or anything else. What do I do? And we at the Division of Human Rights weren't comfortable saying, well, go ahead and say it anyway. You know, say no, answer, just say no, lie. But the legislature was more comfortable doing that. And I don't want to characterize it that way, but this is what it says. If such a question is asked, so if an unlawful question is asked of you in this 296.16 context, the individual, quote, may respond as if the arrest, criminal accusation, or disposition of such arrest or criminal accusation did not occur. So, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because it's unlawful. It's an unlawful request. It doesn't deserve an answer. It certainly doesn't deserve an answer that's going to uh, cut you out of the tenancy, right? And, and, or an explanation even about it. Because not only can it be asked about if the landlord or, or realtor is aware of, of something in the person's um, past, they can't act upon it. So uh, it, it, it's a very strict law. And it's, it's relatively new relative to housing. Again, it, we've been, it's been in our employment section for decades, new to housing in 2019. And I think it's less well known than it should be. And it gives a lot of protection. And it's just a very easy way of, of staying out of trouble as a realtor if you don't ask those kinds of questions. Um, I don't want to go too long because don't leave that question. Okay, I'm a realtor. Go. Here we go. Okay. Um, go. What if the landlord or housing provider does a background check and it pops up? That's why I'm here. It can't. They, they can because not all. Yes. No. That's lovely. They can. They. <laughs> um, that often happens. Background. It, it shouldn't be on. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's been resolved. But you know, I don't know much about background checks, but I know they're often inaccurate. Mm -hmm. okay. Can't act upon it. You can't, you know, unsee what you've seen, right? And I, you know, but if someone sues at the Division of Human Rights, it's going to be a question of credibility. So let's say the tenancy is denied after mm -hmm. that, right? Um, it's going to be a question of credibility when it gets before Commissioner Imperial uh, as to whether someone is telling the truth, you know, was everything a go until then? Did the person otherwise qualify for the tenancy? Did they then take someone thereafter, uh, after learning this, you know? So it's going to become a question of fact that's going to have to be determined at a hearing before the Division of Human Rights, which is where you don't want to be. So, uh, it, but it is true that, you know, um, and, and, you know, it may well be that it, there were other reasons for it. They're going to have to be shown to be legitimate, non-discriminatory reasons once you get to a hearing. And that's where, um, you know, you can't unsee what you've seen, I get that. But you've got to do your best to put it out of your mind and recognize that is not something I should have known and I have to act as though, you know, sort of the way the legislation, you know, act as though it hadn't happened. Lie to yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
Well, you don't. You don't. Because the law says you don't. So if then they say, okay, you lied. You lied. You said it. Well, the, the realtor's not lying, right? But you, if the realtor can't use the fact that they know about this, let's say you, the tenant, prospective tenant said no, and the realtor finds out, well, they were arrested, it was resolved in the favor. The realtor cannot act upon it, nor can the realtor say, you lied on your application, we can't take you. May I just take a little bit of that here? Because as an instructor, and when I teach these courses, and when I teach my fellow realtors, a big part of what I ask my fellow realtors, and I'm also a practice of realtors, you need to learn to stay in our lanes. Sometimes we ask too many questions, we try to be so helpful, and we step out of bounds. Stay in your lane. What are we doing? When you are looking at somebody's Arrest record. What's that got to do with you? We are here to provide access to housing. Stay in your lane. And it's really important that sometimes the person in front of us gives us a lot of information. And we can't unhear what we have heard, but it is really important that we, if we are not sure, then bring it up. If you have a broker, go to them. And we have the Division of Human Rights that we may make a phone call to, or our legal hotline at NISAR. We can check that, but we have to learn to ask questions that will allow us to open the door, step aside, and let the person into that property. That's really critical. I understand that you have to get some information. The information that you're getting has to be able to allow the person access to housing. I'm not going to step off of that, but I do understand the concern that when we hear something, we feel the need to, well, you have to try a little. No, no, folks. I'm sorry. Realtors only. <laughs> not everybody else. Sorry. I get passionate about that. And I know, uh, uh, you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'm going to share with you that we hear a lot of things. We are also therapists, psychologists, and everything else, marriage counselors. We hear a lot of things. And I do appreciate that question, but I think we have to also think about, you know, what sort of information are you going to put on the table with that homeowner who's trying to rent their property? Are you going to say, well, I have somebody with mental issues here? Or are you going to show up and say, we have somebody who wants to rent the property? What are we doing? No. You're, you're here to, you're renting the property to that person. Now, if that person chooses to make a disclosure to the homeowner, that's their prerogative. But we need to understand where we have a role to play. And that's all about access. If I have to take into your account that you have a disability and you've disclosed that to me, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the law says you don't have to disclose that to anyone. As a broker, I have no right to disclose that to anyone. Well, that person comes and tells me they have that kind of problem, you know what I'm saying? And I'm supposed to be focused on them getting an apartment. Absolutely. Well, you if you put it in writing to me, if you put it in writing to me, say, hey, Dorothy, it's okay to tell the homeowner this, and I get that in writing from me. That changes the process. Right. But if it's hearsay, if it's hearsay, that's an issue. 
but I will not be asking for that because I'm afraid to violate HIPAA laws. So stay in your lane. Anything else? I'm not started yet. I just. I know, I know. You have not started yet. Unfortunately, I mean, this is my, me. I'm really blunt about it because housing and access to housing is non-negotiable. We as realtors come across a lot of things that step in the way. And we are constantly navigating. Constantly navigating. When I teach, I teach without exceptions because I don't know the last time the legislature or the law was changed to say that, well, if you're an owner-occupied two-family home or a single-family home, you have this. No. We should be showing property to everybody and step aside and let the homeowner get into trouble. Not you. Because when you talk a lot, you get into trouble. You say things, you overpromise, and you get excited. And I do believe that realtors want to prove that what well, we are trustworthy and we are working in the best interest of the client or the person who's in front of us. And that means sometimes we go above and beyond. Stop it. Oh, I'm sorry. Public? No. Realtors. <laughs> stop. No, this is great. Thanks. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take another question from the audience. I love Dorothy. She's our own FAQ right here. <laughs> so I love that. Um, we're going to go ahead and take another question for the audience. Dorothy. Yes, ma'am. Who's requiring me to get that? So, okay. Okay. So let me share with you how I run my offices. If you are asking, my landlord homeowner is asking for a credit report, I'm happy to have the tenant contact the credit agency and provide that information directly. I do not have access to that information. There's a lot of personal information on that that I'm looking at, and I am not qualified in my own mind to Assess that is the same thing when the homeowner, and I'm going straight to disabilities and assistance animals. When somebody shows up and says, I have an assistance animal, some of us are saying, they have documentation. What makes you qualified to evaluate my assistance animal? Stay in your lane. Don't look at the paperwork. I've got an assistance animal. I'm telling you I have one. I have one. If the homeowner says to you, Oh, you know what, could you get me documentation? My response in my office is no. Let me get your email. Let me put the tenant's email together with you. Attach the HUD and ADA documents with the guidelines I say you can't deny me because of my service animal and have them communicate. I've done my job. I have an attitude. I love my job. Love my job when we stay in our lane. I'm just standing back here. I oh, know. I love it. You know, I got here. We have a lot of alphabets. We have DHR. We have NCY. We have, and I have no alphabets. <laughs> Why? I love it because the the. Please do. Please do. Yes, ma'am. Are we staying within the voucher system or are we this staying regular? regular? On the table and this person's other additional income that is supposedly legal, but they're not getting it. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Okay. But it's not the same. You go first and I'll go. Okay. Well, the, the voucher situation, just to address that, I, you know, with, without, because if, if, we're, if we're talking about earned income, that's sort of not covered by this. but. 
the you know the whole point of voucher and why you need to show additional income so vouchers and you know just very broadly speaking cover usually between 70 and 100% of the rent right and if it covers 100% of the rent why do you need to know about other income at all and there are cases that support Right, but where the where it's between seventy, a lot of, a lot of you know, not necessarily Section Eight, but the other kinds of subsidies do. But the if it's between seventy and a uh, hundred, uh, you know, seventy, eighty, ninety, then the vouchering agency has still figured out that the person has enough income to do that. And so second guessing, I mean, I don't think that the law is, well, law isn't clear about anything because it's just very basic source of income is protected, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, why would a landlord go beyond what the vouchering agency has determined? I mean, the whole point is the vouchering agency has decided this amount will work for this person, uh, you know, and, that's, and they spend a lot of time figuring out how much the person can pay between 70 and 100. And so to second guess that would be something that we would look at when we got that case, if we got that case, uh, if they're requiring a lot of extra income or, or use the ratios or the you know, 40, 40 times the, you know, whatever it is kinds of things or X times, you know, the, the, those calculi that are sometimes used, uh, wh where does it make any sense when the, when the vouchering agency is, has determined and they deter and part of that analysis is whether utilities can be afforded and it's it's you know overall how can people live and you know people who get in you know x amount of dollars they've determined will be able to support themselves these are working people uh, usually not always but usually so um, it, it having requirements beyond that is probably not necessary, and that sounds like it's sort of staying in your lane kind of talk, doesn't it? Well, I think part of it is educating our fellow realtors. So for those of us who do rentals, and I don't do a lot of rentals, and having taken a lot of courses also, um, it's making sure when somebody comes to us with a voucher, we get that paperwork and we read it see what is outlined on the voucher. If you have questions, then we call the social worker or whoever is in touch with that person so that you can get accurate information because sometimes when you ask the person in front of you, they're not even clear. So it's really important that we make the phone call and try to get a response. Now I'm going to go to ghosting. You don't attempt once. You try a couple of times in order to make sure we make contact. And then you get back to the person who came to you and say, I haven't heard back yet. How about you try to contact your person at the agency? Communication and working together will get our little behinds out of trouble. It's really important. We have to keep the person informed. When somebody shows up with a voucher and you say, well, you know, I have to make some phone calls, call me back, and then you don't pick up the phone anymore, that's disheartening to somebody who's looking for a home. So we need to do a really good job in communicating and getting back to the person or the persons who showed up in our space. Great. Um, I think there's other, sorry, there's other questions here. Um, I think COVID has really changed the, um, the dynamics of renting. The mm -hmm. landlords have gotten started with these big um, tenants who have not paid for two years or so. Mm -hmm. Now they've been very restricted to get in. And they're, they're diving into areas. They, they're not in their lane at all. And they have transcended the whole tr process for us. It's become very difficult. And I have to now refer to an attorney. So, you know, call the legal advice, call so and so. And making all those phone calls to come to the agency, but I think there's a stigma attached to voucher um, tenants. They think that they're going to just ruin the place, they don't have the money, and so they want to know the source of income, and it can be off the books because it's all been calculated. But it, I think ignorance has really um, affected everything, and COVID did not help, but it's very difficult to rent now. Document your process. I Document do. your process when you make the phone calls and you reach out. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a call. So, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because even staying in your lane is going through a process. You might, be, you might have this where you have a co-op board. And basically the co-op board is stating you must have a 700 credit score. You don't accept credit data. You don't accept voucher holders. And you got to do a background check, credit check. Plus, you have to fill the application and you have to pay $700, 750 for your application. Because basically, those people are not getting 
co-op issue? Yeah. Go ahead. I, I do. I thank you so much for mentioning the co-op issue because I'm just so interested in everything going on. I wanted to talk about it. So they're, they're subletting basically from a co-op owner? No, they want to get into a development which happens to be a co-op development. Yeah, yeah. Right. Co-op boards think they are just above it all, right? Uh, and they're not, you know, and, and um, I hadn't heard it so much in terms of, of, the, of the source of income issue, but just general discrimination and co-op boards, and they are under the impression, and it is true in most jurisdictions, some have changed, but not statewide as yet, the co-ops don't, you know, the, the phrase is we don't have to give a reason, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, well, you know, if they get sued at the Division of Human Rights, they better have a reason because it, it, they don't necessarily have to, but we will look at who is in your building, who have you um, had applications from, who have you turned down, what have been the standards, and is there discrimination? Because there's rampant race, religion, discrimination, all kinds, every, all, our, all our categories can be ticked by that. And it, it, I, I really want realtors to know that because you are often losing sales because of it, right? I mean, or, or, or you know, your your commissions, and uh, we really are on the same side on this issue. And complainants complaints can be brought to the division. We will look at these cases. We've had co-op cases where they've said just that, or you know, they they give us you know eight you know five letters from co-op board members that are verbatim one to the other, and we think, well, that's interesting that this is. You know, their reasons, all they're all identical. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, and we've settled many cases uh, along these lines. So the frustration, because I hear it when, I, when I've spoken at NYSAR before, I've, I've heard it, how frustrating it is for realtors to have a sale that is stymied by a co-op board that doesn't say a word or won't give a reason. And they will have to give a reason if you bring your complainants to us and we will handle those cases and adjudicate Can them. Can I just ask you a question? Were you referring to rentals? Okay. Yeah. That would, that would also yeah. cover that, right? Well, no, no I mean, I was it. talking I about co op sure. boards in general. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Some of the co op boards that I know do have a minimum price requirement. Um, because, I mean, in speaking to several. They won't let them go above a certain price. They won't, well, in some of the cases I've spoken to, they won't let them sell below a certain price. Well, that's different because I haven't really had that. It's most of the time, they'll say, well, even if everything is selling at uh, 120 and the market is saying, well, we're paying 90, they're not going to allow that sale. It's got to be at 120. That's what we are getting, a lot of the complaints I'm getting. So that's different. Oh, okay. Well, that's different. Okay. All right. That's different. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir.
Okay. One of the things I do have to, and I want to, bring, a lot was said, but I think as realtors, since source of income is protected in New York State, it's a protected category. When I get up and I make a phone call to Ron, and I say, Ron, I see your two-bedroom apartment is available. I have somebody for it. That's the end of my disclosure to Ron. Yes. There is no saying I have a Section 8 tenant. You might as well tell him you're bringing a black person or an Asian to that property. It's protected. We just need to disclose for that purpose. Now, if I show up with my tenant, my prospect, and he says, well, the apartment just got rented, just five minutes before we got there, then we may have to consider whether or not it was discriminatory based on the person I brought there. Because I still haven't told him it's the. Uh, that well, that's a question. You, it's a protected class. It's not a response. No, please. I understand what you're saying, but I also want to say we have another lawsuit hanging out there based on source of income. Because agents responded to those questions. I don't take Section 8. This building doesn't take Section 8. Oh, Ron, does your client take Section 8? Is your person a Section 8 tenant? We, we don't answer those questions. And I think we have, and I, you, I have a, a, per, a qualified prospect for you. I have a qualified prospect if you're, for you. If you're, if you're involved in these programs, I'm not interested. I have a qualified prospect for the apartment. And you, no, no, no. But you're disclosing this up front, sir. You are disclosing this up front. I totally understand it because you need to understand where the law is. Do they, ask me the question. Do they have any programs? I have a qualified client for you. That's the problem we have. That's the problem we have now. Let me explain to you. If we are thinking about wasting our time showing property, you're out of line. We have to. No, let me finish. No, no, no. Let me finish. No, no, we're going to. No, no, no. Sir, excuse me. We're not going to go back and forth. Go ahead. If you. Shh. Hey, 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 hey. Dorothy, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I think we should move on from this question. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, we're going to go ahead and, uh, Caroline, did you have anything else? Well, I just wanted to run by a few other a, areas. We're going to have you run over those few other areas, and I do see yeah, or I, But I'm here. happy in, instead for questions. Go ahead. I think that's perfectly legitimate. There has not been law decided on whether a credit report it fits that category quite, whereas the income requirements, there, which are more direct and obvious, you know, why are we uh, having, you know, that you have to have X amount of income or assets generally when, it, when the rent's going to be paid for, uh, you know, the credit reports almost have, you know, are thought of almost like in a moral sense, right? That people, well, their credit is bad, therefore they're bad humans, you know, and we know this is just not the case. I can't say that baldly. I would say the recommendation is no, because if it's not needed, if the rent's gonna be paid, that's what landlords care about, right? The, the, only, th the only thing that we have is if the credit, record, uh, credit score request is being made, it's being made to everybody. So it's not just uh, for that person, it's to everybody across the board. Go ahead. Now 
Yeah, I, you know. Please, please do. Oh, right okay. Ahead. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Of that so thank you so when that happens I when that when that tenant what when that tenant <laughs> reaches out to me and says Brenda this is falling they I haven't been able to get in touch with the landlord I haven't been able to get in touch with the property manager I write that landlord letting them know giving them some time to get the uh, place back into repair but if they do not get it back into repair I stop the subsidy and I support my tenant to find another place to live yeah, the hard part is finding those places, right now, but we assist them absolutely you're absolutely right. It's not so easy. So when it starts up, I'm I'm constantly in contact with my tenants. So I call them monthly. Um, so my coworker and I, we call them monthly, and we get information from them. How's the place going? I have had situations where I've had to come in, and if they, you know, if there's been pest control problems, I go in, I talk with them, and so they understand that I'm very serious about substandard living, and I simply just will not tolerate it for my tenants. So I go in immediately and deal with it. And I always, I also tell my tenants not to wait until this is a, 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 a mountain. Mm. So in regards to income and working with realtors, we do the calculations. So any kind of income that they get we make sure that it's verified and we do the calculations. So we say um, the subsidy is going to pay this portion and the land and the tenant is going to pay that portion. And if the tenant does not pay their portion, then we also want to hear about that as well. So uh, we are actually standing between you and lunch. So um, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. But I just want to say thank you so much. I love these panels. There's always a lot of fire, but there's always a lot of education. So our takeaway today is get your seat. Our CE credit, provide equity, not just equality, and stay in your lane. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, here's Raj. Okay, now, that, now I'm going to do this. Right through there, we are going to... Nick is a member of the Capital District Black and Hispanic Bar Association, the Albany County Bar Association, the Capital District Women's Bar Association, and the American Bar Association. All the bar associations, right? Love that. As a member of the National Lawyers Guild, she is also the Capital District National Lawyers Guild chapter lead. Nick is a regional deputy for the Hispanic National Bar Association serving Albany, New York. Nick sits on the President's Committee on Access to Justice as a member of the New York State Bar Association. 
Prior to joining LASNNY, Nick was the second deputy counsel for the New York State Senate Majority Council and Program Office. Nick received her JD from Albany Law School and her MPA from the University of Albany Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. I give you Nick Rankle. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, I love that. You know, that's a real uh, post-pandemic experience. Like, hello, everyone, and the callback, I love it. Um, just becoming so much more common. Um, and for people who are viewing uh, online or listening online, I have short hair, I'm wearing a burgundy jacket and a black dress, and I'm in high heels, which are terribly uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you heard, I'm Nick Rangel. I'm the Executive Director at Legal Aid Society for Northeastern New York. I just joined about four months ago, though, and most of my experience with fair housing protections come from my time uh, with the Council and Program Office with the New York State Senate Majority Conference. There, I was the second deputy counsel, and my portfolio included half of the legislative committees, um, and our issues covered uh, a wide range of things, but for this purpose, housing, judiciary, human rights, and government operations. So I'm pleased to be here today, especially after the several years I worked on fair housing legislation for the Senate. Um, I'm going to review, really broad strokes, kind of how we got here on fair housing laws. I'm sure as many of you know, the main federal civil rights law in housing was enacted as part of the Fair Housing Act, which was itself part of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Currently, there are seven classes protected on, in the, under the federal legislation, race, color, religion, sex, national origin. There's that lighting. Hello. Um, Disability and family status. Illegal acts of discrimination prohibited by the FHA include refusal to sell or rent, refusal to negotiate, other forms of refusal to make housing available, and discriminatory differences in the terms and the conditions that are offered. There are a number of other practices, but those are really the, the highlights. Federal law also imposes a legal requirement of affirmatively furthering fair housing on federal agencies and its grantees, including many of the local governments that receive HUD grants. The policy requires agencies to take proactive steps in furthering housing fairness. HUD administers and enforces the FHA through the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. The FHEO, so many acronyms, <laughs> is responsible for investigating complaints and can refer the complaint to state or local agencies. And this is, these are known as Fair Housing Assistant Partners. HUD also funds a number of nonprofit organizations to assist people they believe they ha that have been victims of discrimination through the private enforcement initiative component of the Fair Housing Initiative Program. People seeking housing in New York are additionally protected by the New York State Human Rights Law, which prohibits discrimination by housing providers. The Human Rights Law offers coverage to a broader set of protected classes than those uh, federal seven. Um, we include creed, age, sexual orientation, gender expression, marital status, military status, or unlawful sources of income. And the New York State Division of Human Rights is responsible for investigating allegations of discrimination and filing a complaint with DHR empowers the Attorney General to take proof, issue subpoenas, administer oaths, and otherwise empowers DHR to take action. <clears throat> then in November 2019, Newsday published The Long Island Divided, a report resulting from a concentrated three-year-long investigation of discrimination by real estate agents across Nassau and Suffolk counties. Over three years, Newsday investigators and fair housing experts sent undercover testers dozens of times to different real estate agents from 12 of Long Island's dominant brokerages and recorded those interactions. Investigators also attended six fair housing classes sponsored by the Long Island Board of Realtors to assess the quality of training that was being provided to agents at that time. In 40% of the tests, evidence suggested that real estate agents treated minority testers differently than white testers, 
in paired testing uh, uh, projects. In 24% of those tests, real, real estate agents steered uh, white candidates and minority candidates into divergent communities. In some cases, real estate agents highlighted the racial, ethnic, or religious makeup of a community when speaking with the testers. And in all but one instance, they shared that information only with the white customers. In 8% of the tests, real estate agents denied equal service to minorities, such as requiring only minority testers to show that their mortgages were pre-approved. In fair housing, uh, the fair housing standard experts found that only one of the fair housing classes that investigators intended adequately covered fair housing laws. So following the re release of this report, the state sprung into action. Governor Andrew Cuomo and Attorney General Letitia James took several steps to address the matter with direct agency remediation, public education, investigations, and prosecutions. I'm sure you'll hear more, and you have heard a lot from various state agencies here today in the Department of State, so I don't want to spend too much time on, on those immediate actions. But of note, Governor Cuomo established the Fair Housing Enforcement Program at the, the Department of State. For my part, I worked on the Senate's response to the report as the supervising attorney for central staff over the committees that were involved. The New York State Legislature took action to address these issues by starting with joint public hearings in 2019 and 2020. The legislature subpoenaed realtors, agents, and supervisors if they declined to appear voluntarily. Those hearings included testimony from experts on fair housing laws, best practices for ensuring compliance, and the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic on fair housing and other related matters. The Senate published a comprehensive report in January 2021 based on these hearings and testimony from stakeholders, the documents that we requested, the Newsday report findings, many, many, many policy meetings, um, meetings with stakeholders like NISAR, and uh, plenty of committee research. The recommendations were intended to address housing discrimination that manifests in various forms and occurs in all aspects of the industry, including rentals and real estate sales. That report is available on the State Senate website if you'd like to read the complete report. <clears throat> The COVID pandemic delayed you know, some of our legislative activity in 2020, as you might imagine. Um, but in 2021, the state adopted a package of bills to achieve these goals. And Governor Kathy Hochul signed into law a series of new um, statutes that were intended directly in response to those hearings. So the state created the Anti-Discrimination in Housing Fund and increased fines on brokers. The fines were raised from $1,000 to $2,000 with half of the, um, those fines to be used for anti-discrimination in housing. We enacted uh, requiring additional cultural competency training for license renewal. We enacted a law to standardize intake procedures for brokers so clients Intake procedures can be monitored, I'm sorry, monitored and standardized, preventing discriminatory practices in those procedures. We enacted a bill that mandated additional fair housing training for initial licensing, and those topics include the legacy of segregation, unequal treatment, and the historic lack of access to housing opportunities, unequal access to amenities and resources on the basis of race, disability, and other protected characteristics, federal, state, and local fair housing laws, and anti-bias training. Additionally, we passed a bill requiring uh, broker license fees that, to help fund fair housing testing. Uh, and those fees uh, assist with statewide fair housing efforts. A bill, and a bill establishing the affirmative obligation to affirmatively further fair housing so the commissioner can report significant steps taken in line with this obligation every five years with interim reporting in year two and four. We passed a bill requiring associate brokers that serve as office managers to affirmatively supervise their real estate professionals and established a dedicated telephone number for housing discrimination complaints. So anyone across the state can call this number and get assistance with their fair housing complaint. 
These were tremendous advances in fair housing in New York State, and I'm grateful for the role that I was able to play in staffing these hearings, drafting these bills, and collaborating with stakeholders, and negotiating the final adopted legislation. Now at Albany, uh, at the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York here in Albany, we work to protect tenants and homeowners from discriminatory practices. That can include source of income discrimination, disability discrimination, uh, potentially discrimination in code enforcement practices. Uh, the cases that uh, come to our organization are very, very diverse. Additionally, uh, members of the Homeowner Protection Program, HOP, uh, and that coalition, including LASNI, provide legal services and housing counseling programs across the state to help prevent foreclosure and provide guidance and legal assistance. And sometimes that can include helping prevent or defend against discrimination committed uh, by, for example, HOAs or co-op boards, um, uh, discrimination associated with deed theft and other issues. At LASNI, we are fully committed to rooting out discrimination and bias and promoting equity and equality in housing and elsewhere. In my new role, I'm very honored to serve on the Permanent Commission for Access to Justice, the Access to Justice Committee for the Women's Bar, and the Racial Justice Committee for the Albany County Bar. In, in all of these roles, uh, I personally work on, and LASNI is committed to dismantling systemic discrimination and tackling the day-to-day -day marginal marginalization of minority communities. This sim uh, symposium feels like a culmination of many years' work and really bringing together the real estate agency with state uh, industry, with state agencies and fair housing advocates and housing attorneys to discuss fair housing in New York, and it's really truly wonderful to be part of this program, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Am I am I allowed to take questions, Manny? I see a question. I of course don't have it written down in front of me because I'm the worst. <laughs> um, yeah, we can send a follow up email, and my colleague Tara might be able to look it up. Oops. <laughs> um, we'll get it to to you for sure. All right, if nothing else. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for your commitment to equality and equity and everything that you do. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Brian Green. Brian Green is the Vice President of Policy Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.5 million members. Before joining NAR, Brian served for 10 years in the highest ranking career official as the highest ranking career official in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, where he oversaw the policy direction and operational management of the 600 person office enforcing the nation's housing anti discrimination laws and oversight of over a $150 million budget. Brian was the 2007 recipient of the Presidential Rank Award, the highest federal honor bestowed upon federal senior executives for outstanding service. Outside his policy work, Brian writes on, hit, on history and culture, contributing regularly to the Smithsonian Magazine. A 2017 article Brian wrote on the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival led to his work as a consulting producer on the Academy Award winning film, Summer of Soul, which I really enjoyed. Thank you for that. <laughs> Brian earned his degree in government from Harvard University. Now I give you Brian Green. Thank you. Oops. So I want to thank the Division on Human Rights uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you haven't forgotten about me. You know, I used to work very closely with the Division uh, when I was at HUD, um, but in my three years at uh, the um, National Association of Realtors, I'm pleased I've been invited twice, uh, I think, to come up and speak. So um, really a great pleasure, um, and a great pleasure to see many of my friends here today. Um, and uh, it's certainly an honor to celebrate with you uh, 
and observe with you uh, where we are on the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, the 55th anniversary of its passage in 1968. It's always, um, I, I want to say bittersweet in a way, because um, I was also born in 1968. And so, uh, you know, when we celebrate the Fair Housing Act, we're also uh, tracking my age. And, uh, you know, for those of you who are fair housing folks, you know, you turn 55, you can live in a 55 and older uh, community. <laughs> um, I don't know that I can, because I, I still have three young children under the age of 18. Um, but uh, that's not really where I'd want to be. But, you know, it's funny, you know, when, when I remember uh, enforcing the laws and they would talk about 55 and older communities and, you know, an active 55 and older community, et cetera. I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm 55 now. Like, <laughs> I think I'm still active, right? Um, and, um, and it's also a great pleasure to be here in New York. Uh, I grew up in New York. And in fact, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to visit uh, my mother, who's in the house uh, my parents bought in 1967 and that I grew up in, in St. Albans, Queens. So I was just there. And, um, you know, it's changed a lot over the years. Um, St. Albans um, is in the southeastern part of Queens. Um, it's overwhelmingly African-American community and has been for, for many years. Um, it's the, it was the home of many jazz musicians. Pretty much every jazz musician you can think of uh, lived there at some point uh, in beautiful homes there. And, um, and uh, of course, it was not always uh, an African-American community. In fact, uh, it was around the time that the jazz musicians were moving in that uh, there were fair housing struggles uh, before we had a Fair Housing Act uh, in St. Albans. And, um, African Americans were uh, able to purchase um, when there were some white homeowners who were willing to sell, but many of those homes um, had racially restrictive covenants in them. And um, many homeowners decided they were going to defy uh, those covenants. Uh, in 1946, there was a woman, uh, Sophie Rubin, who sold to an African American man. He's described in newspaper articles as uh, a Negro merchant from Manhattan. He was living on 148th Street. And like many uh, Harlemites who had money, um, including those jazz musicians, he wanted to have a, a single family home with a, a garage and a front yard, backyard. And so uh, Sophie Rubin agreed to sell the home to him, but her neighbors uh, did not like that. And uh, the neighbors pointed out that when she bought her home, she had agreed to a covenant that said it would not be sold to Negroes. Um, and they sued her to enforce the covenant. Um, and another um, enterprising uh, white man in the community, uh, Paul Silverstein, uh, was her attorney and uh, a very, very great advocate and uh, worked with all kinds of organizations uh, throughout New York on that case uh, in the hopes of making it a test case to challenge covenants nationwide. And so the American Jewish Congress joined, uh, the American Defamation League, the uh, ACLU, the National Association uh, for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, all joined behind this case in, in 1946, uh, but it was decided against Sophie Rubin and the African-American purchasers, the Richardsons, um, in 1947. They appealed uh, to the Court of Appeals right here in Albany um, that year, and then, of course, in 1948, while that appeal was pending, Shelley v. Kramer um, uh, made it to the Supreme Court, and, and that case invalidated covenants nationwide. Um, and at that point, the Court of Appeals uh, reversed its earlier decision, um, and Mr. Richardson and his family did move into that home. Um, and that case, Kemp v. Rubin, um, I understand is um, precedent in the, in the state and has actually been 
sort of a significant case to establish um, fair housing rights, or had been um, since then, um, for the state of New York. So that happened there, um, and the um, neighborhood progressively um, uh, changed demographically. Uh, more African Americans moved in, and again, you know, they were African Americans of means, uh, and, and uh, there was more white resistance. Jackie Robinson moved into the neighborhood, uh, and there's a Jet Magazine story from 1952 about a cross that was burned in St. Albans, Queens, um, near Robinson's property uh, to intimidate uh, blacks who were moving into the neighborhood. Um, so that was happening in Queens in 1952, and in that article, um, uh, Jackie Robinson's wife said that uh, she didn't believe that this, this would intimidate people and that her white neighbors would stay, um, but they didn't. And by the time I came along in the 1960s, um, the, the community was all African American. It's a remarkable neighborhood in that it's overwhelmingly homeowners. Um, and um, you don't see this too often in the United States. Um, National Geographic actually, a couple of years ago, wrote a story about St. Albans, Queens. Um, and I was quoted in that story saying that America's fair housing story, that St. Albans represents America's fair housing story in microcosm. And by that I meant, well, one, it demonstrates what you can achieve, <clears throat> but the white flight is, you know, the story we see in many communities nationwide. Um, and then in the 90s, um, St. Albans, like other African American neighborhoods with high home ownership rates, um, were was a target of uh, predatory lending and home improvement scams and other uh, measures to basically extract wealth from people who had it and who had achieved the American dream. Um, and I remember in those years telling my parents not to, you know, answer any of these phone calls, not to respond to any of these home improvement. Uh, solicitations, not to listen to any of these uh, solicitations that, uh, you know, were coming to their church. Um, but uh, it ended up, as a, a community, one of the communities that was uh, most hurt by um, these, um, these home improvement and other predatory refinancing schemes, uh, one of the worst in, in the country. Let me also say that while it was uh, a community of homeowners, um, the homes did not appreciate as well as uh, homes in some of the white communities in Queens, uh, despite you know this being a beautiful community. Um, it also saw a lot of disinvestment as well. Uh, you know, when I was young, it seemed like there were a lot of shops and a lot of businesses, but those also um, began to disappear throughout the 70s. So in that way, I also say it's somewhat of a microcosm of what you see in some other African American communities. Um, and <clears throat> while that community had high home ownership rates, it is exceptional. When we look today across the country, we have major gaps in home ownership um, when we look at racial groups. Um, the United States, we're a nation of homeowners in that the majority of the country are homeowners. 65% of Americans are homeowners. Um, the white home ownership rate is at about 73% in this country, which is really high. Um, the Asian home ownership rate is at about 60%. The Hispanic home ownership rate is at about 51% and trending up. The African American home ownership rate is at 44%. So you have about a 30 percentage point gap between African Americans and, and whites. And uh, you've heard this, it's widening. And it's not widening so much because the African American home ownership rate is going down, although it has some, especially after the targeting following the sub, uh, during the subprime years. But it's also because the home ownership rate for whites continues to climb, while the African American home ownership rate is um, pretty stagnant. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, why that is and what we might do um, to see that <clears throat> we close these gaps. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there are gaps between every racial group. Um, some of those rates are going up. The Hispanic rate is going up, uh, and Asian rates going up as well. Um, 
but um, some of the challenges we have with respect to the African American home ownership rate are challenges that are affecting everybody, and I'll talk some about that. Um, first, let me say that home ownership, I talk about it not just because I'm with the National Association of Realtors, but um, because it is the major driver of wealth in this country, and it has been for uh, a century. Um, when we talk about home ownership and the American dream, homeowners have 40 times the wealth that renters do, 40 times. So while you can, you know, play the stock market and, and you know, seek wealth in other ways, um, home ownership really is what drives American wealth. And Dr. King, you know, whose tragic uh, death led to the passage of the Fair Housing Act, understood that and was talking a lot about home ownership. Um, and, and housing opportunity before he died, um, and talking a lot about the wealth inequity in the country. If you ever have the chance, if you haven't seen it, there's a great interview with Dr. King from 1967 uh, by NBC. It's in color, actually, uh, and uh, if you Google it, you can find it. Um, and he's in Ebenezer Church uh, giving this interview. But most of the interview is about wealth and about how um, we have denied wealth to African Americans in this country. He talks about the Homestead Act and how immediately after the, uh, after the Civil War, uh, when he points out that African Americans were told, okay, you're on your own, and he said it was basically freedom and famine that was offered to them. At the same time, our country was giving away millions of acres of land to its white citizens and recent immigrants. Um, and then also investing in land-grant colleges to help people farm. And how that alone began to uh, uh, exacerbate inequality. I mean, African Americans had nothing. Um, but then if you see through successive times we've had opportunity to build wealth in this country, uh, African Americans and other people of color were denied that. Of course, we had uh, the racially restrictive covenants that I mentioned. We had whole communities with racially restrictive covenants. Everyone knows Le the Levittown example. Uh, we had uh, the GI Bill where folks came back from uh, uh, the war and had the opportunity to buy uh, low interest rates, loans from the government, um, which African Americans did not have the opportunity to participate in. Um, we had redlining, which was both privately practiced and then government codified. Um, so we had whole subdivisions that were built with federal government dollars that were restricted. And so this was in the lifetimes of people we know, certainly my mother who I just visited. And that wealth inequality or that wealth or that exclusion has led to intergenerational wealth inequality and the wealth disparities that we see today. One of our biggest challenges, though, in addressing this and trying to fashion policies that address this when we talk about housing is the failure for most Americans to recognize it, even though this is within the lifetimes of many people. And I just saw an NPR um, survey, or actually it was a story where they included a survey, where they asked Americans um, what they thought the differences in wealth were among racial groups. And I think they maybe just asked black and white. And Americans thought that for the most part, um, there was the same, uh, you know, that people were equal in terms of wealth, that African Americans had comparable wealth to whites in the United States. Um, and they said that, okay, maybe African Americans have less, and maybe like, uh, 90 cents to the dollar, when of course the reality is it's 12 cents to the dollar. And I just was, I was just shocked. I'm like, are people walking around thinking this? I'm like, where, where do they think this wealth is? That like people are hiding it offshore or, or in, their, in their pillows? But part of the problem is people are looking at income, I think. Well, it's two things. One, we're very segregated, so people don't necessarily know how people live. But two, I think a lot of people think, okay, you know, the, the guy in the cubicle next to me, I know what he earns and what I earn, and, you know, it's roughly comparable. But they are not factoring in that most wealth is in housing and um, 
And that's where you see these great differentials, and that's an intergenerational differential. Um, we see it at the National Association of Realtors when we look at, um, when we look at uh, who's buying homes. So we do a study every year, which we call the, the um, a snapshot of home buying by race. And just as one example, African Americans um, represented just 5% of home buyers last year, right, even though they're about 13% of the population. And when you look at who's succeeding in purchasing a home, uh, a lot jumps out. First of all, the typical African American home buyer has a graduate degree. They cluster around graduate degrees. Uh, the typical white home buyer has a college degree. Why is that? Because if you don't have family wealth, you have to earn the income in order to qualify. And so African Americans are seeking higher degrees in order to get the income. And how are they doing that? Because also many didn't have family wealth to send them to school, like equity in their homes that would allow for that. So many are taking out student loans. And so we see that African Americans are twice as likely to have a student loan compared to a white American and much more student loan debt. Um, white Americans are, are, are likely to find, or twice as likely to find the proceeds for their down payment in the sale of a previous home. We see that in the data. And Hispanics and African Americans uh, by multiple times are dipping into their 401k in retirement. African Americans are three times as likely, Hispanics are twice as likely to be dipping into their 401ks to, to um, find their down payment. So essentially <clears throat> borrowing from the future. Uh, and then um, while these were successful home buyers, uh, we did ask you know some people like how many times had they sought to buy before they were successful. And we saw that for African Americans, they were more likely to have been denied before they were successful, and they were more likely to have had either a credit or a debt to income issue. Uh, and again, if you have less wealth, if you have less income, and if things cost the same, a Toyota costs the same, the eggs cost the same for everyone else, you're stretching more money, college costs the same, you're stretching more money, uh, um, stretching less money to afford those same things. So you're likely to have those issues. So what can we do about these things today? Because uh, <clears throat> obviously there are fair housing implications here, certainly uh, racial disparities as a result. Well, at the National Association of Realtors, of course, we know we have to make sure there isn't discrimination in the marketplace. Um, we talked about the New York Newsday study, which was an eye-opener for many real estate professionals. Of course, that, uh, that story came about my um, first week on the job. <laughs> so I was addressing that immediately. And uh, we, we did some pioneering things, among others, you know, certainly uh, improved our training. But I kept telling people, of course, training is not the issue here. You see people talking about <laughs> their training, what the law is, and flouting it. Uh, so we've done a lot in terms of accountability. And we've actually challenged um, many state governments to do more in terms of strengthening the real estate licensing laws in those states as well. So something actually happens when people engage in discrimination. So we've done a range of things there. Um, but, you know, even when we address discrimination, th this legacy, as I described it, um, is self-perpetuating if you just, if, this, if there's a wealth issue. Um, one of the things we also can do is make sure in terms of credit that we're addressing some things. Right now, uh, I think we all know that uh, typically, and someone mentioned this uh, today, your, your successful rental payments are not taken into account, your, your regular rental payments, your positive rental payments are not taken into account in your credit. Finally, the uh, GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, have said we should take that into account. And uh, they've used uh, artificial intelligence to begin looking at positive rental payment history. The artificial intelligence can look at bank accounts and look at whether certain large payments are being reliably made. And they have found that that can increase your credit score by 9 percent, 12, uh, 12 months of positive uh, rental payments. And so that information is now um, um, 
being included in credit profiles by the Fannie and Freddie. And so there's more that can be done around this as well. Student loan issues. Uh, student loans um, are significant uh, debt item for young people. Um, but as I just described, student loans are often a road to uh, higher income and you know higher earnings overall. And so there is discussion about how that debt should be looked at differently. Medical collections, people have found that medical collections aren't truly um, predictive in terms of uh, loan defaults. And so that information is being reviewed so that it can be treated differently. And so we at the National Association of Realtors have been also working with other partners, the Mortgage Bankers, National Association, uh, NAACP, the National Urban League, um, in a collaborative called the Black Home Ownership Collaborative to look at these things. And it's called the Black Home Ownership Collaborative, not because it's exclusive, but because this is the widest gap and the one that, if we can address, can benefit others. And so we've talked about these things that we need to do. We're doing advocacy in Washington on that. We're also saying, you know, we have to make sure our fair housing laws are better enforced. And while there's much I could say on that, let me just say uh, one of the main things we want to see happen is we want to see agencies uh, and HUD do more to exercise their secretary-initiated or commission-initiated authority. That um, we're not going to solve these issues. We're not going to make a dent in segregation and some of the other problems if we are just passively accepting complaints. That um, government agencies, you know, who your tax dollars fund, um, need to be more proactive. Uh, we have been strong advocates of testing, that we need to do more testing. Newsday underscores that most people who face discrimination don't know. Most of those testers uh, of color uh, were not aware that they were facing discrimination until they saw a video of how someone else was treated better. So for us to tell people, if you face discrimination, file a complaint, uh, does not necessarily yield those complaints. And so government uh, needs to step in there and make sure that whether it's real estate professionals, whether it's other housing providers, are doing what they're supposed to do. And so we're strong advocates of testing. Um, and then, you know, uh, this collaborative has been put, you know, promoting other uh, measures, um, special purpose credit programs. Lenders can, uh, can, can uh, comply with the Fair Housing Act and design programs that will um, better meet credit needs in communities. And down payment assistance can be helpful, too. One thing about down payment assistance, though, is it's very hard to use down payment assistance in a market where housing costs so much and where other people can outbid you with cash. So we support down payment assistance, but it's going to be hard to keep up with rising costs of housing. And so I want to conclude by talking just a little bit about housing supply. Housing supply, in my mind, is one of the biggest fair housing issues of our time. Um, I know that in the state of New York, folks are trying to address this, and I'm not going to get into the, the you know, state proposals, but let me just say, um, throughout this country, we don't have enough housing. Um, NAR has estimated that we are 5.5 million units short, which is about 15 years short in terms of where we should be. Um, and that is one of the main reasons that housing is so costly. Scarcity um, causes, um, makes housing inexpensive. Sorry, makes housing expensive. The other challenge uh, we face throughout the country is many people don't want new housing in their communities. And, uh, you know, that becomes a barrier throughout our country. And so community by community has to look at that issue. And certainly I think there's more the federal government can do to create those incentives. We don't have what people call the missing middle housing. We don't have housing that's um, affordable to the typical American and, and particularly duplexes and other um, small multifamily housing um, that would make housing more affordable throughout the country. So we have to address that. And if we don't address housing supply, we are actually going to see these um, gaps 
among racial groups in home ownership get worse. And we're starting to see that, and you know, that is one of the reasons uh, the gap is widening and has widened in recent years. On top of all of this, there are, in many communities, what people call institutional investors, large firms who are buying up whole subdivisions of housing, which is making housing even more scarce, and they're renting that housing. And so, and where are they going? They're pr predominantly going into communities of color. Um, and so in the Atlanta metro area, for an example, uh, over 30% of the homes that were sold in the past year were sold to institutional investors. So that makes the remaining housing that's available to individual consumers that much more expensive. And finally, let me say, uh, if you don't believe what I'm saying, take a look at a place like San Francisco where uh, the minority population, especially the African American population, has been decreasing because of housing scarcity um, over the years and, and affordability over the years. Uh, one film even made a joke of it, uh, the title of a film that won um, Big Sundance Award a couple years ago was called The Last Black Man in San Francisco. So, um, and I, I, you know, when I was at HUD, I met with the current mayor, uh, London Breed, about this, and they were trying to find ways to, like, you know, keep populations in the city without running afoul of, of fair housing laws. But they were, they've been very concerned about this for years that uh, there isn't a home for many people there. You may remember that Willie Mays moved out to San Francisco when he, uh, the Giants left New York and went to San Francisco. And it's kind of bizarre in a way, it feels like it's, it's, moved, it's turned full circle. Willie Mays, when he first went to San Francisco, faced discrimination. Um, he bought a beautiful home um, in like the Sherwood Forest area. And um, you know there had been lots of opposition at first, he, he was denied one home, and he finally bought a home out there. Um, but while he was out on the road, um, someone threw a brick through the plate glass window. And he and his family, and this was like 1957, decided uh, San Francisco wasn't the place for them um, and left then. And where did they move? They came back here. They came back to New York, and they came back to Westchester County and bought a home in New Rochelle. And I saw this news story, which I think uh, I'll end with, which where he was welcomed back to New York. It was a white neighborhood in New Rochelle, 1960. And a, the New York Times quoted a Mrs. Philip I. Blum, who said, uh, so yeah, Mrs. Philip I. Bloom, whose house was opposite uh, the mazes said, we have been delighted to welcome the newcomers, and if they got a bad break elsewhere, we will do our best to make up for it. So we've got a lot to make up for, but I'm confident the people of New York can do it. Thanks very much. Thank you all so much. We're going to start our final panel for the day, the CLE panel, uh, in just a few minutes. But just a reminder, for anyone who is an attorney, you need to sign in and sign out to get credit for this panel. So if you are an attorney seeking credit, just make sure you go to the registration table, sign in, put in the time, uh, and then you can get credit for attending the panel. So we'll be resuming in about five minutes. Thank you all for being here. Museum tours. Anybody who's interested in a museum tour, 30, it's um, going to be leaving from the registration area. It is a fair housing tour. There are artifacts from our agency started in 1945. Well, they know. I don't know where the
the registration table is. Do you think it's this one? This one. You can go for the museum tour. But you had the card. So, should if you want to get CLE credit, which credit for your presentation. So, so registration should be right through there. Oh, I forgot that part earlier. I was being co-moderator with John. Listen, that was fine by me. No. Something I mean, it's true. Hot mics coming in. I've heard Please. anyway. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck. Yeah. Yeah. It's a no, definite there's... issue. There's no question. Just to figure out. Yeah, I've heard of many angles. Yeah. Of right. So. I think it's oh, it's bad. We're gonna have to like clean up a bit. It's gonna take us a little while. Okay. Yeah, right. Guys for love. So <laughs> like this. No, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Harrigan. Hi, hey, Tara Glenn. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. So let me just check on registration and we can get started shortly. You know what? I probably am not. <laughs> <laughs> to get to, to get the ceiling. I did. 
I did, thank you. Just one last reminder, please make sure you signed in if you want CLE credit. We should be getting started shortly. <laughs> you might want to move over one. You don't need uh, five seats. Casey is not. Okay. Casey, all right, input. Oh. You guys want a little elbow room? Yeah, there you go. So which legal aid office are you with? I'm with the Plattsburgh office. Oh, Plattsburgh. I was just up there. Oh, nice. Yeah, we were at um, <coughs> so like St. Joseph's Community Center or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went there with the Office of New Americans. Yeah. So they have a first group. Okay. Because they are not very sensitive. Gotcha. And they're live right now. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, so we are at the final panel of our Fair Housing Conference. Thank you for sticking it out and <laughs> continuing uh, to join us and learn more. This panel is about impact litigation. It does uh, carry CLE credits. You needed to, if you're a lawyer that wants credit, sign in, take the affirmation and the survey. Uh, and return that at the end, as well as sign out at the end, and you'll be able to get your CLE credits. Um, again, my name is Jill Faison, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for External Relations at the Division of Human Rights, and it is my pleasure to welcome our panelists. We have John Harrion, who is our Disability Rights Director at the Division. We have Tara Glynn, who is the Managing Attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. And we have Joel Marrero, who is an Assistant Attorney General with the New York State Office of the Attorney General. We are unfortunately not joined by Casey Westman Vermeulen. Um, he's from CNY Fair Housing and is not able um, to join us today, is feeling under the weather. And we thank him for not bringing whatever he's got here with us. So, um, as I said before, the title of this um, panel is Equity Through Practice, Impact Litigation. So we're going to be talking about the laws and the lawsuits that we, uh, as a group, are bringing to change practice, to, um, you know, push forward fair housing uh, through holding people accountable um, in court. So um, we have federal laws, we have state laws on fair housing. So John, can you start us off talking about, from the division standpoint, what law we're talking about and enforcing? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, my name is John Harry, and I'm the Director of Disability Rights for the New York State Division of Human Rights. So our agency enforces the New York State Human Rights Law, uh, which you've heard different um, provisions talked about today in terms of the prohibitions against discrimination and. Uh, uh, and the protected classes um, that are covered. Uh, my area of focus is on people with disabilities, uh, or close to 60% now of the complaints that our agency receives um, against housing providers, or in that context of housing, uh, include allegations of discrimination based on disability. So we see a high volume in that area. Um, I'm going to talk about reasonable accommodation. Do you want me to cover that now, or are you going to go Q&A on this? I think we're going to just talk um, panelist overview. by panelist in terms of the overview of the law okay. that they cover. Okay. Uh, and just to talk a little bit how, about how we enforce that law, um, we are considered to be a user-friendly alternative to the court system. Uh, while uh, you can file a complaint in state court, 
you can uh, alternatively file a complaint with our agency. There's no filing fees. You don't need to have a lawyer. We have a prosecutions unit that's staffed with attorneys who prosecute these cases. And um, all of the remedies that you would find available in state or federal court, you know, to stop the discrimination, to compensate a, um, an individual who's experienced discrimination, uh, to make sure a reasonable accommodation is provided, to make sure the housing is provided, uh, are all remedies that are also at the disposal uh, at the New York State Division of Human Rights. Thank you. And Tara, do you want to share with us the law you practice? Sure. So um, I've been with the Legal Aid Society for just under 10 years now. I've been a housing attorney that entire time. Now, as a managing attorney, I oversee other housing attorneys. So I live and breathe the world of low-income housing. Um, when, in regards to discrimination, we'll use any law that's applicable. So that includes New York State human rights law, which we've heard about. It also includes the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Fair Housing Act, Section 504 of HUD regulations, if those rules apply, as well as potentially any local laws that um, or rules that may be in effect. Um, we also take advantage of uh, programs like the Division of Human Rights will make a lot of referrals, will assist people with drafting and writing their complaints to make, sh to, to make it as easy as possible for the division to conduct their investigation, um, especially if it's not something legal aid can take further than a complaint. Um, and similarly, we'll make <laughs> referrals to the Attorney General's office, uh, who has investigatory powers, which, which I'm sure my colleague will talk about, uh, that often far exceed the resources that my firm has. So it's a multifaceted um, approach. We'll get involved pre-litigation, during litigation, defensive litigation, affirmative litigation. It's really uh, client-centered and whatever helps our client the best. This is Excellent. The Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, the Thank microphone you. for our ASL yeah. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Joel Marrero, an assistant attorney general with the New York State Office of the Attorney General. I'm in the Civil Rights Bureau and our office has authority to not only bring suit, but as um, my other colleague had just mentioned, um, has a authority to initiate investigations, uh, specifically issue subpoenas for testimony and documents um, on individuals or entities that engage, and this is language that comes from Executive Law 6312, that engage in persistent fraud or illegality. The illegality prong includes violations of state uh, federal and local laws. Uh, those include, for instance, the New York City Human Rights Law, uh, the New York State Human Rights Law, the Federal Fair Housing Act, ECOA, uh, Title VI and Nine. so it really runs the gamut. Um, a lot of the work that we do, um, while we are in, uh, while we do receive complaints from the public, a lot of the work that we do, uh, either enforcement matters or lawsuits that we bring, aren't, by and large, they're not on behalf of individuals. So we're not the attorney for say the complainant, but we do have authority to seek relief on behalf of impacted people. Uh, so when we bring cases, whether it's a, a case that's initiated under 6312 or if we're relying on what's called parents patriae authority, that is common law authority that empowers the state attorney general to bring, um, to bring suit on behalf of the people of the state of New York uh, for a violation of law or some type of harm that's been inflicted upon them, um, including violations of the Fair Housing Act, we do so on behalf of the general public, on, on behalf of the people of the state of New York. And so what that means is that we typically seek remedies that inure to, uh, uh, to the, the, the state of New York or the people of the state of New York. And so, for instance, um, we would bring, we have brought suit on behalf of, and I'll, I'll discuss this in a minute, but we've brought a uh, suit against a municipal a municipality that um, used this land use authority to prevent the development of housing uh, for discriminatory reasons. And so the relief that we sought there, you know, these are things that typically private plaintiffs uh, would seek um, programmatic relief, such as training and um, some type of reporting requirements, an agreement to comply by the law. But depending on the violation of law, we can seek and we have are, we are seeking things like compliance uh, testing. So if there is um, a housing provider that we believe or we have evidence of, of that they've engaged in um, unlawful discriminatory conduct, then we would demand that that entity or individual 
uh, pay uh, a, a fair housing group, for instance, for the cost of future compliance testing to ensure that they are actually complying with the law, so that it's not just an agreement on paper that they're going to abide by the law, but that they actually have to demonstrate a compliance with the law. Something that we're also seeking in our source of income cases are set asides, and so. Um, this ensures that um, that landlords that um, have a history of discriminating against people with vouchers, in fact, rent to people with vouchers. Mm -hmm. And these are remedies that, generally speaking, depending on the, on the nature and depending on the type of case, depending on the plaintiff, um, are generally not available to individuals who are seeking monetary or entitled to monetary relief. And so what we're really, the, the point I want to emphasize is that we seek the types of remedies that ensure not only uh, particular defendants or targets compliance with the law, but the relief that would, um, as best as possible, undo the, 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 the harmful impact that the conduct has had on the people of the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you. If you pass me the mic, thank you. <clears throat> so it sounds like, you know, big picture, systemic, uh, litigation that, that the Attorney General's office that, that's right. is engaged in. Excellent. So um, I want to talk about reasonable accommodations. Donnie talked about that at the division, a majority of our cases are filed on the basis of discrimination based on disability. So can you tell us about um, the rules of, of reasonable accommodation, what the contours of the law are? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, we've heard a lot today about the uh, fair housing uh, civil rights laws that protect people in a variety of protected classes. And, you know, similar to those protections for people with disabilities is the prohibition against denying a housing opportunity, denying housing services, or diminishing them in some way, uh, or threatening to evict somebody, worse yet, or evicting somebody because they have a disability, clearly all prohibited by the law. Um, but under each of these laws as well, there's an affirmative obligation to reasonably accommodate. And that means doing something a bit differently than what you are um, uniformly doing, uniformly applying to all the residents of the housing. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a couple of different things. It can mean making a structural modification, uh, putting a ramp where there's a step, installing a handrail, uh, modifying a bathroom to make it usable and accessible. Uh, it can also mean modifying a policy, so having a no pet policy uh, being waived so that somebody can use an emotional support animal, somebody with a disability who has a disability-related need for the emotional support animal or a service animal would also be a form of, of reasonable accommodation. So I just want to take you a little bit through the language in the statute and, uh, and parse it out a little bit. So um, what the state human rights law and the Federal Fair Housing Act um, prescribe is, is a refusal to permit, um, at the expense of a person with a disability, reasonable modifications of existing premises occupied or to be occupied by such person if the modifications are necessary to afford said person uh, full enjoyment and use of the premises. So that's a mouthful, but it is a CLE program, right? So we have to talk about the statute. Um, so in just parsing that down a little bit, in order for there to be a refusal, there needs to be a request. So, um, you know, these, these rights attach when somebody um, asks a landlord to make a modification for them, uh, to make the home usable um, and accessible to them. Um, we're talking about existing premises, okay? Oftentimes we get position statements where the respondent will, um, um, you know, say that they, uh, their building was built before the law was passed, they're grandfathered, grandfathered in. Um, I like to say the extent of our investigation in those cases is to ask whether or not the premises exists. And if it indeed does, you're covered by the law. So there's no grandfathering in. We talk about premises that are occupied or to be occupied. So if you're moving into the premises uh, and you anticipate needing a reasonable accommodation, uh, the law covers you as well. And there's some interesting case law um, uh, around that issue that involves uh, cooperative boards in New York City where there's kind of a Q&A on need for accommodation and um, you know how that kind of plays out with the, the tension that exists in the law about you know prohibiting housing providers from asking about disability. So again, we get back to that, um, you know, in terms of reconciling that, that the, um, the, it's un, un, unlawful to refuse, so that request needs to be there and in place, um, and that, that does reconcile the tension a little bit 
uh, that exists with the prohibition against housing providers from asking, do you have a disability? Because oftentimes those type of inquiries lead to a denial of a housing opportunity, if indeed that's the uh, housing provider's motivation. Talks here about modifications that are necessary to afford such person full enjoyment to the premises. I like that language uh, in the statute, full use and enjoyment. Um, we have cases filed at uh, the agency where there's a request for a ramp and uh, our investigators will do site visits. They'll go out and take a look at the premises and um, you know the landlord will say, well, we have a ramp and we'll go check the ramp out and there's a ramp there, but it's in the back of the apartment building and is used to remove the garbage and uh, certainly not being used as a, as a way to, uh, to get in and out of the building that's enjoyable for anyone. So um, you know we can rely on the strength of the language and the statute that's there uh, that speaks to uh, use and enjoyment of the premises being realized uh, when these accommodations are being provided. Um, there's some language here too about who pays for the modification. So under the state human rights law and under the Federal Fair Housing Act, if it's the interior of the unit, okay, uh, the obligation to pay for the modification is on the tenant. Uh, the landlord cannot refuse you permission to do that work, uh, but there is the way the law is written, that's where the obligation exists. Uh, a distinction between the state human rights law and the Federal Fair Housing Act is uh, when it comes to common areas. So uh, if you're filing a complaint and you're talking about an area that's commonly used to get in and out of your building, front entrance, laundry facilities, recreational facilities, parking areas, et cetera, uh, the burden to pay for those modifications where it's reasonable to do so is on the landlord. Uh, so oftentimes our investigators, you know, we get these cases, whereabouts are we talking? when it comes to the modification in order to understand who's gonna be paying for these modifications. Uh, I'll talk briefly about um, pets and parking. Uh, parking, uh, we get a number of cases at the agency asking for accessible parking spaces. People who have mobility impairments need a parking space close to their unit. That is another type of accommodation that's contemplated by the law, required by the law. We get a variety of responses to those types of complaints. Uh, some are we already have the requisite number of spots that the building code requires, or we have um, we have spots available, but they're available on a first come, first serve basis. Um, neither of those, I mean, it's helpful to meet your building code requirements, but what we're looking at is the this particular individual complainant who's before us and what their need is for the accommodation. So having a first come, first serve parking space for somebody who needs an accessible spot near their unit isn't going to accommodate their disability. So we're really looking at making sure that um, you know that arrangement is made for that individual complainant in front of us. Uh, the other issue is our service animals and emotional support animals, which are not pets. Uh, they're covered much differently. So you can have a pet policy that covers the size and, and, and shape and types of pets that you want or don't want in your housing premises. But when it comes to service animals and emotional support animals, those are also two types of accommodations that help people with disabilities, a variety of different types of disabilities to, uh, to improve the quality of their life. And um, allowing somebody to uh, live with an animal, um, uh, whether it's emotional support or a guide or a hearing or a service dog or animal, again, it's a little bit of a broader universe when we're talking about housing rights for people with disabilities and the type of animals that are allowed. Um, those two are types of accommodations that are um, contemplated and required by the law. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about the service animal issue, emotional support animal. It usually elicits quite a bit of conversation and questions. Um, so I'll leave that to there rather than get any deeper into it. And I'll turn things over to my uh, colleagues here. Thank you so much. Um, I just also want to note that um, there is a link, a uh, Dropbox link with everyone's materials. As you see, we're not doing you know, the, the PowerPoint thing, um, but all of the materials for each of the presenters will be available to everyone that is registered. Um, Jill, can I just finish up? You touched on it, but I should probably just re-emphasize the notice requirements since we are talking about reasonable accommodation. So in uh, 2022, there was a law passed, Jill covered it in her presentation, but just to re-emphasize that housing providers must provide notice to um, uh, tenants and prospective tenants uh, that they have a right to request reasonable accommodations because of their disability. And we think this is going to increase the number of requests and again, em empower people with the knowledge that they have the right to make those requests uh, should they need it for a disability. Absolutely. And Tara, did you have anything to add on reasonable accommodation? Uh, sure. So 
I second everything uh, that John said, but and I agree that emotional support animals and service animals by far is the biggest uh, barrier that I've experienced in my professional career about housing rights in regards to uh, disabled tenants. Um, it elicits a lot of conversation, um, whether it be in lawsuits or public settings. But uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, um, just as an example of, of what um, was discussed is I think a lot of times when we talk about reasonable accommodations for disabilities, there's um, some that are more obvious than others. Uh, ramps for mobility issues, parking places for mobility issues, service animals have become a very well talked about uh, one. Um, accommodations for the hard of hearing, such as like fire alarms and things like that. But one that's not often talked about are other invisible disabilities, um, and in particular, one that uh, there's a high correlation with the populations that I serve have to do with mental and cognitive disabilities. Um, so people who might be struggling with um, mental illness, uh, people who might be struggling with uh, cognitive disabilities, and sometimes we have to get, as their advocates, get very creative with the types of reasonable accommodations that we're requesting. Um, and I think an example might make this more, um, make this easier to understand. We recently had a client who suffers from a hoarding disorder, mm -hmm. um, as well as dementia and ADHD. Those three together are quite a terrible combination <laughs> for this poor gentleman. Um, and he, they were all relatively recent diagnoses. He had had a lot of, anyone who knows anything about invisible disabilities, it is often very hard to get these diagnoses. Um, so once he finally had these, we got a team put in place to really uh, benefit from a social worker perspective, his quality of housing, but his housing provider had already had enough of this. So our reasonable accommodation at this point, where he'd already been cited for violating a numerous, numerous housing rules, because he was a hoarder, um, our accommodation at that time um, was a relaxation of the rules mm -hmm. to give him more time to bring his unit into compliance because now he finally had the personal accommodations he needed with the team in place to not only bring his unit into compliance but to keep it in compliance on an ongoing basis. Um, Ultimately, that was a happy resolution. There was a lot of litigation about it, um, which also included the housing provider admitting on the record to discrimination. I actually got to say, Your Honor, that that is discrimination. Mm. <laughs> what opposing counsel just said is literally discrimination. He said that because of the hoarding disability that my client was a danger to everyone else in the building. I'm like, that. there you go. I couldn't have asked for a better example. Um, so I think it's important if you do this type of work that, yes, you'll often come across the, I hate to say it this way, but the most the more typical types of accommodations that people are requesting, but that reasonable accommodations can really be specific to your client. What does your client uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and what is it they need to successfully live in this housing and draft the reasonable accommodation to fit that. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out, because I don't think we have noted it in this panel, so one of the backstops of this is as the undue hardship, as the landlord is saying, okay, this person is a hoarder, they're covering the methods of egress, uh, you know, and violating building code is an undue hardship to ask me to do, uh, to allow this type of behavior in the unit to accommodate the disability. How, how does that um, back and forth play out? Are there any best practices in negotiating on a reasonable accommodation against that backstop of undue hardship? Sure. So um, whenever I'm working with a tenant um, in crafting their reasonable accommodation, I try to put myself in the position of being against them. What would I see to say, how, how would I say no to you? <laughs> and then come against that, right? So again, with the hoarding, as you said, you're you know, blocking passive egress, this fire dangers, there's things like that. So how do we how can I anticipate what we can put the other person, at e the housing provider at ease for? Um, and while I'll have a game plan for that, I think first off, it's also always, that's the landlord's obligation to state what their undue hardship is. While it's best practice for you to anticipate it, 
Um, you don't have to do their homework for them either. Um, but in successful cases with, with hoarding, um, we've had things like monthly inspections for a set period of time, six months to a year, to show that the tenant's able to be in compliance now that they have this team in place. Um, other times when there's been code violations, I've offered my services to talk to the code officer um, and to help the landlord ease those burdens. Um, it's great when you can work as a team with the housing provider on how to best do this. They don't want to get in trouble, but as long as they're like, I do want your tenant to be successful here, that's the best case scenario. Unfortunately, that's not been my experience more, yeah. <laughs> more often than not. And it's kind of like you have to beat them over the head with it. Um, however, I have found typically code officers, health departments, other regulatory agencies are overwhelmingly on the side of the tenant. Mm -hmm. They they see the point. They're like, oh, you're trying to remedy it. Sure, you can have more time. It's usually the housing provider that doesn't want to provide more time. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else on reasonable accommodation? Yes, briefly. Um, before I discuss the case, um, just on your point, Jill, about um, best practices. Um, so once a, a tenant or their advocate makes a request for reasonable accommodation and it's reasonable on its face, because that's that's the key part. Um, that triggers what's called uh, the interactive process, and so a landlord, if they're gonna if they're gonna grant the request, that's you know that ends the matter there. But before they deny the request, they have to engage the tenant in, in sort of this back and forth and get a sense of the reasonableness of the request without prying too much into the tenant's um, either. Um, impairment, and whether it be physical or mental, um, because the tenant, of course, um, you know, they, they can make the request, but they need not disclose the actual condition that they have. So that's something that's um, key. Now, now, there are, of course, you know, if, if the tenant describes the sort of the, their impairments or the symptoms from their impairment, the landlord could reasonably infer, you know, the impairment, um, but there's no, there's no uh, requirement that the, that the tenant um, you know, specify what you know the condition that they actually have. They just need to describe, you know, the the, the make the request ideally in writing because they'll need proof if this ever goes to litigation. Um, and then, you know, if it's reasonable on his face, again, this triggers the landlord's obligation to engage in the inter interactive process. If the landlord doesn't engage in the interactive process, that's not necessarily a, a per se violation of the law, but that could be evidence of of. Um, that the, that, that the tenant could use in court to show that the landlord did not act in good faith. Um, so we, we receive complaints, the State Attorney General's Office receives complaints from the public. Um, many of these include um, complaints that landlords failed to grant reasonable accommodations or modifications. Generally speaking, um, we, you know, if it's an individual complaint that has no um, implications for, you know, uh, more than more than beyond that that person, we generally would not get involved because we have the DHR, we have um, county um, human rights commissions, state human rights, uh, city human rights commissions that are well equipped to handle these individual complaints. Um, but we did have in twenty in around 2015, 2016, um, a tenant who lives in Saratoga Springs, uh, about forty minutes north from here who uh, complained to our office that their landlord refused their reasonable accommodation request to have an emotional support animal. Um, that really was just, at that point, we were just gonna treat that as a referral to the DHR until the landlord sued the tenant for filing a complaint with our office mm -hmm. and sought declaratory <laughs> relief, including a declaration that the Federal Fair Housing Act is unconstitutional. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, that kind of met our, our sort of our, our test for like yes this is have, does it have an, imp an impact or some type of statewide implication on protecting communities in New York State of course absolutely so that's when we intervened uh, the I don't know folks practice um, I, I kind of divide the sort of uh, court practices between New York City and then the rest of New York um, in, in part because it's been our observation that uh, judges particularly state court judges outside of New York City just tend to, um, are, are, are generally less w well acquainted with the fair housing laws. And so um, this judge, the judge that initially got the case, got the law wrong. And 
decided on some um, important issues in, in favor of the landlord. The case went on appeal. It was remanded back to uh, uh, the trial court and uh, almost, I think this was like last year. So this was like fast forward five, six years later, the case was set to go to trial and we settled on the eve of trial. And so over a reasonable accommodation request, right? Something that um, in actuality would have had no impact on the landlord's business, on you know, on their ability to to operate the property. There was, in fact, the tenant didn't even have an animal. That's the other thing. They they intended to get an animal, so um, the landlord really could not have demonstrated um, any facts to show that the request uh, would have um, represented an undue burden. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing to keep in mind with reasonable accommodations is that the landlord can't stereotype. So if the, if the tenant says, well, you know, I want a dog and I want a chihuahua, mm -hmm. and a lot of people think that chihuahuas yap a lot, you know, that they're yappy dogs and, and they make a lot of noise. And, that, and so a landlord can't rely on those stereotypes. They must rely on facts that are particular to that animal. So if that specific animal has posed some type of danger or some type of nuisance, and it's not just, you know, dogs bark. Right, it has to be something that's um, really disturbs or in interferes with the use enjoyment, other other tenants' use and enjoyment of the dwelling, uh, for it to constitute um, an undue burden on the landlord. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate. Can I build off of it? <clears throat> sure. Um, something something my colleague said that uh, triggered me. Is, so I I practice in the North Country. I practice in Clinton, Essex, Franklin, Hamilton, and St. Lawrence counties. Um, and what you said about um, the judges being less acquainted with these areas of law is, in my experience, been absolutely true. Um, and even in speaking with my colleagues in the Legal Aid Society uh, in the Capital District, that also proves to be true. So I also practice prim uh, predominantly in justice courts, which often have um, non-lawyer judges, which uh, has its own Obstacles. Challenges. Distinct challenges. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> that's a great way to say it. Um, so, it, again, if, if this is where you find your practice to be, if, if this is, if you're going to be representing people seeking reasonable accommodations, especially when it's going to go to court, but even at the landlord level, you have to prep yourself for likely, especially at least in upstate New York, you are likely going to be the expert in the room and you need to educate everybody along the way with that. My memorandums of law are famously 36, 40 pages because it's, here's what the FHA says, here's what New York State Human Rights Law says, here's what the RPAPL says about discrimination, here's what everything is, because it's very likely that the advocate, that the judge you're in front of, or even the landlord, or opposing counsel sometimes, has never looked at these at all. And the public knowledge about these laws is so poor you know, people will say, it's like, well, that's not reasonable for you to ask a landlord to do that. Not only is it reasonable, it's legal, and I can, and it's a right that we have to do, so. Thank you. And, you know, I think that out of all of the basis uh, for housing discrimination, disability is probably the best known one. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of segues into source of income discrimination because it's one of the newer protected bases, protected classes, um, you know, uh, in terms of housing discrimination. So um, let's see, who would like to speak to source of income discrimination? I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> okay, you can start us off, Joel. Do you want to pass the Yeah. Great. So I'm not sure if folks are aware, um, the New York City, so our, as I mentioned earlier, our office enforces local, state, and federal laws. Um, in New York City, the New York City human rights law protected source of income um, in around 2013. I think that's when it was um, amended to include that protection. And so um, at least with New York City and other jurisdictions, other cities across New York State that had these protections before 2019, these laws um, in theory were enforced. Um, our office was pretty aggressive to the to the to the best it could be, you know, in the circumstances, but generally speaking, these laws, um, it's been, you know, our observation that these laws are not enforced to the extent to which the violations occur. So we, 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 it's, in other words, 
um, source of income protections, um, or I should say source of income discrimination, is something that is unfortunately tolerated um, by the industry and it's, it's an accepted practice. And so in, in around 2021, our office decided, and this was um, in around the same time that the Housing Rights Initiative filed its, um, its lawsuit against 80-something um, housing providers. We have real estate brokers and brokerages and landlords in New York City that were subject to, uh, I, I believe this was a federal fair housing lawsuit, and they, they also had brought a city one, they brought one in Westchester. Um, in around that same period, our office launched a source of income discrimination initiative whereby um, assistant attorney generals across the state in our regional offices, in the Civil Rights Bureau, and the Housing Preservation uh, Unit um, got together. This is, this is about a team of 15 to 20 attorney generals, and we're tackling this issue head on. And so we um, are working with a fair housing group um, in New York State, among other fair housing groups that provide us referrals, um, to uh, conduct um, strategic testing and receive their complaints um, and their testing um, information um, related to landlords and brokerages um, that um, have demonstrated source of income discrimination. And so through that initiative, we opened countless investigations um, on landlords, on brokerages, on brokers, on real estate agents. Um, and those investigations have been launched under Executive Law 6312 because these are business entities. And so under this law, we can and we have uh, subpoenaed these entities, individuals for documents. I've taken numerous testimony from landlords and housing providers and real estate agents. And, uh, you know, as folks can imagine, the sort of the, the explanations, the reasons, the fact patterns, they're generally in the cluster of you have a real estate agent who, you know, the tester calls they ask about the availability of housing. They ask about the unit, where you know what floor it's on. Does the building have a washer dryer? All those, you know, all the things that uh, you know, um, prospective applicants generally ask. And then at the very end, they'll disclose. Well, do you accept Section Eight? And um, sometimes the responses range from no, this landlord does not because they have stringent um, rental requirements. To well, unfortunately, let me get back to you, and then they never hear back from them. So ghosting. Um, or no, not at this building, but you know, there is this building down the street that's owned by this landlord that where you know you could apply. So steering. And um, and these these practices um, all violate the Fair Housing Act and the New York State Human Rights Law. I say Fair Housing Act because the Fair Housing Act does not explicitly or expressly protect source of income discrimination, but it is our position that these that this form of discrimination constitutes disparate impact discrimination on the basis of race. Uh, familial status, and um, depending on the jurisdiction, if we have the data to prove a disability. And um, mm -hmm. and so we initiated uh, several investigations. We've, as I mentioned, we've taken uh, testimony, and in some cases, uh, we've resolved some of these matters. Some of these matters are still ongoing. We have brought suit against some landlords, including one in Binghamton, who in deposition stated that they'll just, they will absolutely never take Section 8. And so that's, you know, that's direct evidence of discrimination. Um, for those who are, are practitioners, we need not rely on the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting standard where we, you know, have to allege circumstantial evidence. We have direct evidence. They say they will never accept Section 8. Uh, the thing to um, keep in mind here is that these protected classes, classes, they're not, there isn't a hierarchy, right? There isn't a sense of like, well, race discrimination is at the top and source of income discrimination is at the bottom. They're all equally protected. And so in our conversations and our settlement discussions with uh, landlords and their attorneys or brokers and their attorneys, we emphasize that, you know, trades, trade, I will never accept Section 8 with, I will never run to a family with minor children. It's, it's the same. It's, it's the framework is the same. And I think um, as, as simple as that, as that sounds, I think that that for um, uh, lawyers that tends to sort of listen to an aha moment, where they're like, oh, okay, yes, I, I, I'm beginning to see the light. And um, if, if they are a rational actor, which sometimes they're not, um, that will you know, oftentimes lead to some type of early resolution. Um, it's been our experience that we tend to resolve cases in and around the time where we're ready to take that position or, or examinations. Uh, landlords, um, their attorneys are sometimes fearful of just having their testimony because this, this is uh, taken because this is a public record that can later be used. 
Um, but, you know, we, as I mentioned, we launched this initiative about a year and a half ago. We're seeking remedies that run the gamut from, and this is sort of our, our sort of bottom line where we seek these types of remedies, training, uh, change in policy. So, for instance, if we discover that a housing provider has a policy where they're demanding 40 times the rent in, in, in a way that does not account for the voucher, right? Um, we're, we're, we're generally taking the position that if the voucher covers the entire rent, there's really no reasonable basis for the landlord to subject the applicant to an income requirement. Um, we're also asking for, of course, training. Um, if there is um, an impacted person, so if there's a complainant, a bona fide complainant, if there's a fair housing group involved, we would seek some type of relief on behalf of, of those complainants. Um, if there's a fair housing group involved, we would also seek um, what's called sort of frustration emission damages, and these are forward-looking, and this could include compliance testing. Like, as I mentioned at, at the top of the presentation, this is something that we think helps ensure that the landlord complies with the law, and we also seek set-asides. And especially for landlords who have a large enough portfolio where they could um, reasonably, you know, meet that threshold, that set-aside threshold within the effective period of the, of the agreement. Thank you. You have anything else on source of income? I or on disparate impact, which I think both. <laughs> okay. um, Take it away. So one thing I just wanted to add to, to what Joel said. So Section Eight, I think, is the is the biggest way that uh, most people interact with and see source of income discrimination. Section Eight, just for those who don't know, is a voucher program operated by HUD that allows you to bring it into the private renting world. Um, but it covers all other sorts of protected income as well. It covers social security payments, whether you get social security insurance or social security disability. It includes temporary assistance provided by the Department of Social Services and OTDA. It includes um, sometimes private subsidies. We have some mental health associations that will provide subsidies for tenants of theirs or will cover security deposits or things like that. And all of those can, uh, workers comp, I mean, I can keep going. You know, the, there's there's a bunch of different types of protected income um, and all of it is covered under this. Um, I'm glad that the, the, the way that you've described the interaction you've had with some of the landlords, that sounds very pleasant, um, the times that I've come across it. Uh, go on Craigslist, go on Facebook Marketplace, you'll just see straight up, do not accept HUD, do not accept welfare, have to work for a living, all sorts of just really offensive ways that they just blatantly are saying that they practice source of income discrimination. Um, you know, we've had tenants who, you know, same thing, they go through the whole process and at the end say, well, the Department of Social Services is going to pay my security deposit. They just get hung up on, said, I don't know why you wasted my time. Um, a lot of just really terrible things. Um, our office, I will say as a practitioner, sometimes it's really difficult because while I could uh, march down there, you know, not march the landlord's door down and say, you have to do this. This is illegal. You can't do this. Then the tenant is living in a place where they know that the landlord is strong-armed mm -hmm. into letting them there, and it's just not a very comfortable place for them to be. So often that's not what they're seeking. Often they're seeking you know, our assistance helping them find renting elsewhere, which isn't really what we do as we're a law firm. Um, but that is where referrals to Division of Human Rights and the Attorney General's Office can be really helpful, especially with the Attorney General's Office initiative. We've done that a lot in the North Country, working closely with our AAGs in Plattsburgh and in Watertown, um, letting them know of the bad actors that are in our community. This is their experience. So that, that helps that ongoing investigation where the AG's office can get involved. Um, similarly, we work I think anyone who works in the housing world works with a lot of sister agencies. Um, so I work with the Department of Social Services, I work with charities, I work with outreach, whether it's the STEP program, ESG program, other people like that. HUD agencies, the, the agencies that are putting out the Section 8 voucher, in my experience, a lot of them are very behind on the times. I will routinely have to deal with uh, Section 8 administrators who will say, oh, well, that landlord doesn't want to work with us anymore. They do not have a choice. They have to work with you. You should not be accepting that. Your job is to advocate for your clients 
not wait till they come to me for me to advocate for them. <laughs> um, not that I'm not happy to do so, but we should all be on a team here. So a big thing that, that I've taken on and that at the Legal Aid Society we try to work on too is panels like this, other forms of community education to make sure that everyone's aware. Because again, in, in the re outside of New York City or some uh, specific cities, this has only been the law since 2019 and you know, it came into law and then boom, we went into lockdown and nothing happened for a while. So it's kind of as if this law just went into action. So we're finding there's still a lot of growing pains. Right, absolutely. That is something that we find also at the division and um, we are constantly trying to get the message out there to the community through events like this. Um, and other, you know, community education programs um, to make sure that folks understand what their rights are, uh, specifically under um, source of income. Okay, so are there other case examples? I know, um, Joel, you wanted to talk about redlining um, in, in housing discrimination, um, but John, before Joel jumps into the redlining examples, were there any other cases that you wanted to lift up um, for our participants? Well, I think what I, what I wanted to, um, to talk about a little bit about is the Division Initiated Investigations Unit that exists in our agency. So that's a, that's a unit that's dedicated to um, uh, investigating uh, complaints where there's patterns or practices of discrimination. So uh, I oftentimes get asked, can I file a complaint anonymously? I don't want you know, them to know it's me filing the complaint. And um, it may not always be the case, but we, uh, we do have a division initiated investigations unit that can you know, look at these instances and you know, clearly from the program today and other programs we've attended, source of income, reasonable accommodation issues for people with disabilities, um, you know, come up again, time and again. And, um, you know, to Brian's point, you know, the importance of government enforcement agencies um, having resources to be able to bring to bear against those patterns and practices of discrimination to kind of make big picture change uh, is necessary. So our agency does have a unit, uh, it has uh, investigators and prosecutors in it, and. Um, Again, a lot of the information we gather from these types of events helps us to formulate um, different types of investigations to fight and combat pattern and practice type discrimination. But I also invite you to connect with us and to continue to connect with us uh, to let us know where you're seeing that in your communities. That's right, that's tips at dhr.ny.gov. Okay, Joel. Um, so our office, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, enforces uh, the Fair Housing Act and other federal civil rights laws, including the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And um, pursuant to that uh, mandate, we are we partnered with the Department of Justice to uh, open an investigation into a Rochester and Buffalo-based lender. Uh, we studied um, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, so HMDA data, and the data revealed that this lender um, underperformed vis-a-vis -vis its peers with respect to its lending to not just minority individuals, but minority communities in the area where, in, in their service area, essentially. And um, we opened this investigation. We issued, um, unfortunately, with, with federally chartered lenders, and this is um, under federal law. We're preempted uh, from issuing subpoenas, so we can't examine their books and records under Executive Law 6312. But we can issue um, letters um, asking them to uh, voluntarily comply with our request for information. And so that's what's happened. And um, in this investigation, we have concerns. We, we still don't know what, you know, we're still learning. We're in the, in the discovery phase of the investigation. Um, but one of the things that we're looking for is whether a uh, this lender is um, engaging in disparate or um, differential um, marketing or advertising practices. So, for instance, are they sending mailers and advertising primarily in white neighborhoods or to uh, white white um, you know clients as compared to um, minority um, borrowers or minority neighborhoods? Um, is there um, a larger footprint or non-exclusive, I should say non-exclusive, um, in, 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 is there app, locations of branch offices? And so this is something that um, the Department of Justice typically looks for in their investigations. 
and um, and if there are branch offices located in minority neighborhoods, are they open during you know the same or during you know, the same hours as you know the branch offices in non-minority neighborhoods? Are they open on weekends? Do they offer the same types of services? Um, and is there any other evidence that they've uh, that the uh, that the lender tolerates discrimination in the staff? And so we do searches for um, uh, correspondence, emails, et cetera, that, or, you know, or that certain terms are being used. Um, and um, this is something that we recently um, launched with the Department of Justice. This is something that I understand the Department of Justice is doing across the country, um, that they're partnering with AG offices and other state regulators to tackle redlining. Um, one thing that I will say about redlining, um, and I think that this sort of relates a lot to source of income discrimination, is the intersectional nature of these forms of discrimination. And so redlining, um, the lack of credit to um, minority homeowners will often mean that they are unable minority in, uh, communities, uh, minority borrowers won't have that ability, that capacity to purchase homes, including multifamily homes in, in areas that um, are generally uh, within, say, the payment standards. And so these forms of discrimination have compounding effects on other uh, protected bases. And so we launched this um, investigation really with an understanding that we are looking to um, create secondary and tertiary benefits um, or um, forms of relief to impacted communities. Um, and we're focusing on the, right now with this investigation, on the Rochester Buffalo region. Um, in part because we believe that uh, we're also considering home prices and values. Um, and these are regions where um, the values of homes uh, comparatively are within, um, are, are generally affordable as compared to say Long Island, right? Or Westchester County and New York City. Uh, um, I, 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 I know, I have very few friends who I know can afford New York City um, to buy in New York City. None of us do. <laughs> Um, and so, yes, and so that's, that's our redlining um, investigation, and I'm happy to save questions for the end. All right, so before we open it up for questions, are there any other um, items that you just wanted to raise for our audience before we turn it over? Um, the only thing I wanted to, to briefly talk about is that, you know, as, again, as a housing uh, practitioner, um, the discrimination that often my tenants have felt um, rarely presents itself in an obvious way. Um, it's really helpful when it presents in an obvious way. While that's terrible, it's very easy then to point it out and to get everyone on your side. But it's a lot of times on the practitioner, and I, I think it was as the keynote speaker spoke earlier, a lot of times people don't know that they've been discriminated against until they learn other information. And a lot of times as uh, the advocate, you know, I am I know how these proceedings go. I know what other tenants in that building have gotten because they were my clients too. So I'm able to identify sometimes that discrimination. Um, so I just would say that it's important to, to stay creative. Um, one example is I had, a, I had a tenant in senior housing who had the most bizarre complaint being filed against her and she was being evicted because of it. She lived on the first floor and her upstairs neighbor, no wait, no, she lived on the second floor and her downstairs neighbor was constantly complaining that something was dripping off of her, the upstairs balcony onto her downstairs patio. And it was outrageous and you couldn't let this happen. It was some yellow gunk that no one could somehow ever see. And it, it was very odd, but then as and I kept pinning down on it. I'm like, but why is she saying this? Like, we understand that the downstairs neighbor is clearly lying. This doesn't exist. They're making this up. But why? People don't tend to do something for no reason. And as we untangled it, the upstairs neighbor, the client of mine, is a lesbian. And she didn't have her partner live with her. They had separate residences, but the partner would often come over. Once the downstairs neighbor knew that, now all of a sudden the complaints were manifesting. Mm -hmm. And then in other interactions, and once we figured that out, we were able to talk to other neighbors and the downstairs neighbor had very vile opinions about the LGBTQIA community, including frankly odd ones that I just never heard of before in, around cleanliness and things like that. Um, and so once you were able to dig into that, then you could see it's like, well, there it is. That's what it's about. And then you point it out to the landlord and say, if you side with downstairs tenant, you're siding 
with discrimination and you can't do that. So I have a myriad of examples with that. I won't take everyone's time, but it's just, I think it's important to, to dig for those because that's the issue with minority communities. That's the issue with the invisible discrimination people often see. Um, it's such a burden to them. You as their advocate can take on some of that burden by helping them find it and helping educate them and everyone else about why you can't do that. Can I add something to that? And I, I agree 100%. Um, you know, the case law with tenant on tenant harassment and the landlord's liability is trending in the plaintiff's direction. And so um, you're seeing courts now um, adopt this, this rationale that a tenant who then harasses another tenant and does it out of animus, um, you know, say racial, sexual orientation, gender, um, and the landlord fails to act to take reasonable steps to protect the um, other tenant, the victim in this case, um, could expose the landlord to liability. On this, on this point about not knowing of sort of the base, the reasons why um, a, a discriminatory discriminator may may be motivated or why they're acting in a in an unlawful way, um, I really do want to emphasize, and this is important for the work that we do at our office. I'm sure this is important for the DHR um, and a lot of the other organizations that are here today. Is the the significance of testing. And so um, one reason why source of income discrimination, um, we, we now have this initiative in, in, in a way that we hadn't had before is because of the prevalence of testing in this space. Um, you know, we, we, received a, we received a good number of complaints where a person who's, you know, with a voucher would complain to our office and they, they, you know, they're alleging that they believe that they've been discriminated against, but they have no, let's say, text messages, they have nothing in writing, nothing in, uh, no recording, um, just uh, exhibiting some type of discriminatory intent on the behalf, on, on the part of the, the housing provider. Um, in the absence of that, it really behooves the, 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 the complainant to work with a fair housing organization, with a, a city organization that has testing capabilities because it's that evidence that would allow us to um, essentially, uh, you know, um, deduce the, the discriminatory intent and, 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 and get to court, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I, I want to second what you just said. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. And, you know, I also want to, um, you know, third, big up our, our testing organizations across the state. They do amazing work. CNY Fair Housing is one of them. They weren't able to join us today. Uh, we also work with the Fair Housing Justice Center um, in doing presentations across the state. Um, and, you know, you talked about intersectionality and how large of a burden it is on the person who is being potentially discriminated against to figure out, to sleuth it out, how they're going to prove that they've been discriminated against. And so it is a wonderful program and, um, you know, pretty well funded, which is, an, you know, an excellent show of its importance um, to have that program in the state of New York. So I think we'll open it up for questions from the audience. I see one over there in the corner. Hi, Colin Morales from the Greater Mohawk Valley Land Bank. Um, I had a question this morning, but we ran out of time. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily applicable here, but I would be curious to get some feedback. Uh, we've seen an emerging issue, which is kind of flipping this on its head, of municipalities and government officials, especially in rural communities, that are um, really averse and sometimes out, outright hostile to affordable housing projects. Yes. And I think part of what has happened um, as I think about this kind of upstater, born and raised, but having lived in New York and seen some of the issues down there, is I think the uh, small newspapers, a lot of them have gone away in the last 10 to 15 years. What's happened is a lot of these I represent uh, roughly 160 communities in my catchment area, and going to these meetings, sometimes it's just me and the officials, maybe a couple other, a code officer, things like that. And increasingly, you know, over the last 20 years, I've seen the, you know, it used to be you'd have a crazy person in the audience. Now sometimes some of the vitriol is actually coming from elected officials, sometimes mayors, um, even in email. I, I, I often 
right. you know, or things like that, where they just, you know, and a lot of times these are people that do this three, four hours a week, and they haven't gone through any training, you know, legal or otherwise, and they may just be the local pharmacist or whatever, and they're just doing this part time. But what they're doing is they're they're creating a hostile environment to affordable housing, and really, I think it's a discrimination on a much larger scale where they may be preventing a need for their community for right. hundreds of people. I think that it is uh, a pretty often. Um, you know, situation where you have local opposition to affordable housing pro uh, projects, depending on, you know, who it is, whether you're talking about the local zoning uh, folks, the mayors. And I think that some of our friends on the panel have brought suit. I hear you on the need for education, <coughs> the, the fact that perhaps, um, you know, preventatively, uh, there, there, you know, is work that needs to be done in educating folks about, um, you know, fair housing rights, uh, about anti-discrimination. But once the discrimination is happening by the mayor, by the local zoning board, I think that our friends on the panel, um, you know, can talk about the the lawsuits they brought as a result. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll take that. So um, again, I work in the North Country, uh, exclusively rural. Um, I think our biggest city has 19,000 people in it. Um, <coughs> and uh, I face this constantly. Um, we had a, we saved a mobile home park from being closed by turning it into a cooperative and the local town turned down uh, CBDG grants because they didn't want to help those people. They didn't want to help people where the cops were called and none of them worked and things like that. We had to go through the county to get it. Um, I've represented tenants in horrifying housing um, where the town, the code officer, um, they didn't care. They're like, well, that's what they get for cheap housing you know, you're welcome for it. That's what you get. Didn't matter that ceilings were collapsing, that there were, there was a bat infestation, which is the first I'd ever heard of that, um, and things like that. In my experience with these types of uh, practices, it's a one-two punch. Education only works if you give them an incentive to learn. Um, coming in there telling them, look, these are the rules you have to abide by. Like you said, they only do this three to four hours a week. A lot of times it's like, uh, that, that doesn't happen here. We're not racist, we're not biased, we're not whatever. We don't have to listen to that, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, until you sue one of them. And then you sue the town and you win, and now you can go to all the neighboring towns, be like, you don't wanna be that town. So let me tell you how to not be that town. Um, that's worked like gangbusters. <laughs> um, so, and, and in regards to code officers, a lot of times, um, I have a love-hate relationship with code officers. They have a very difficult job, um, and there's a lot of bad code officers out there. But the new law that's been passed uh, that goes in, uh, into effect at the end of June, this is kind of segue to this, but it allows tenants the affirmative right to sue for repairs done in buildings. I'm really hoping that that can bridge some of that gap and get code officers more on our side, that they're not seeing the tenants as this annoyance that they have to keep dealing with, but that they can work with us to actually kind of take work off the code officer's plate. Um, but unfortunately, that's the only way that I've ever seen to have it work, is that you have to show them that you're a force to be reckoned with and that this is a population they have to deal with or else it'll be a problem for them then the education, and then hopefully the compassion and the empathy come after that. In, in, in the case of like a municipality that's seeking to block, let's say a hundred unit development, like who would be the litigant? And one of the things that I think is concerning too is a lot of these housing developers that are affordable housing developers that work across the state, there's a great reluctance to make any waves. What they do is they say, well, okay, we're not going to push in this town because we're going to go to this other town nearby. We don't want to get a bad name. We don't want to be the ones, the squeaky wheel. And I'm also a quasi-governmental entity, so I'm also having to work with, you know, so it's like it's a, it's a difficult needle to thread. But I think that it's one that does need more attention, but on the larger scale, not just like a resident with a lease or whatever. I mean, I'm talking like we're actively blocking 
So our office, uh, a few points. One, if you do have that sort of smoking gun evidence, that email. Um, wants to know about it. I want to know about that, right? Um, so send, it you know, to Joel. send them my way. Um, the other thing to note here, and this is a wrinkle in sort of the state law, the New York State human rights law does not expressly apply to municipal governments, at least with respect to the fair housing provisions, right? I'm not, I, I, I don't want to contradict any position that the DHR has taken, but it's owners, lessees, um, sub lessees, and agents of, of these individuals that are subject to uh, 296.5a. Um, and so the Fair Housing Act is not concerned with the status of the defendant. It's only concerned with conduct, conduct that results in the unavailability of housing or causes the unavailability of housing. What that means is that um, if we were to, and we have brought suit, uh, we brought suit against the town of Chester in Orange County for um, refusing to, not, not necessarily, not just refusing to allow a development to go forward, but intentionally erecting barriers to frustrate this development that residents believed would have resulted in this in, in, um, increase or inclusion of Hasidic people. Um, the town claimed to um, be doing this to further the Fair Housing Act because they believed that this developer was going to market and sell the units exclusively to Hasidic people, which would be unlawful. And so, but in town public hearings, you had residents come out and say um, some awful, very awful, you know, anti-Semitic things that the board then adopted by action and by their own statements. And we relied on that, on the, on that public record to, to intervene in the private developer's fair housing lawsuit against the town and the county. And so we, there is precedent for our office to intervene, but we generally look for strong evidence, particularly as it relates to land use or exclusionary zoning, because these cases are very resource intensive. You have the Department of Justice that filed that Oyster Bay case. I don't, I don't know if it's still pending, but it's been years in litigation. And, um, and, and one reason why that is is because the defendants, they aren't private actors who are paying for the attorney's fees. These are people playing with other people's money. Mm -hmm. And so they're not internalizing the cost of litigation. Mm -hmm. And then they also have residents who are, you know, they feel are putting them in a very difficult place where if they were to say vote, you know, the board were to agree to some form of resolution of the case that would result in this, you know, development, development um, you know, the building of the development, that would then put them at odds with residents who, you know, are, are staunchly against people that they believe are going to live there. You also have school districts. Um, that in some jurisdictions will play this de facto land use uh, sort of agent where the, land, where, the, where the town will ask a developer to seek um, the school district's buy-in to a project before the, the board votes on it. And so in, in, if, if, the, if, the, if there's enough there to show that the that the school district or the board is an agent of the of the public of the board or the town, you can also have, you know, there's also exposure there for the school district um, under the Fair Housing Act, and so there there are there are laws there 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 are legal theories that we could um, rely on to bring suit, but the the problem is, and this is sort of similar to source of income discrimination, is that it's so ubiquitous. It is, it is bipartisan. It's not just a, a Republican town. You see these, you know, see, you see these practices in, in some of the bluest places in New York State. And um, the, the issue is that we don't have statewide standards with respect to land use. And there are some judici there is a judicially created um, standard that requires that
on one person seeing something. So. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Over there? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Cliff. Oh, my name is Cliff Perez. I, uh, I am assistance advocate at the Independent Living Center of the Hudson Valley Employee, and I've been a disability rights advocate for the past 38 years. I dealt with many of the laws that you're talking about. I helped them get passed. Um, my issue is here we're talking about we're celebrating fair and equitable housing. I can assure you that does not exist for people with disabilities. It's not no fair housing. You don't get equitable housing. And I've heard the whole time here talking about access to housing, but not access to accessible housing. I get emails from the Attorney General who talks about affordable housing, but she never talks about accessible housing. I to go further here in this room. I've heard people refer to people with psychiatric disability as mental. That's derogatory and negative. Nobody spoke about that. Um, there is talk about, I heard somebody talk about uh, somebody suffering. I assure you, we do not suffer from our disability. What we suffer from is our society's lack of accessibility for people with disabilities. We suffer from society not treating us with dignity and respect. That's what we suffer from. It isn't the disability. Um, and in terms of all these laws, which are wonderful, you say we have a law for this, we have a law for that, but the problem again is one, there's virtually no enforcement of many of these laws, and especially when it comes to people with disabilities. And then there is the issue of, well, you can take it to court. Even in the case that you just mentioned here, about a reasonable accommodation to five years, how does that help that person? And then there is the issue of whether you can even find an attorney who will help you, because many of the agencies that we have here are supposedly to help people with disabilities without mentioning any names, don't help hardly anybody. In the 38 years I have been doing this, I don't think that one person I've recommended to the various organizations with disabilities had any help whatsoever. So I just want to make that very clear that people with disabilities are not getting the kind of help that you think that they're getting simply because we have certain laws that nobody enforces and nobody really addresses. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Are there any other questions? DHR, which is the acronym for Division of Human Rights, at ny, dot ny dot gov, sorry. Dot Tips ny. at dhr dot ny dot gov. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. The other thing is, too, that I wanted to bring up is about the Olmstead Act, sort of piggybacking what Cliff said is, um, Sorry. The Olmstead Act, Olmstead versus LT, um, it basically is the in act. The 1999 Supreme Court decision that talks about. Cliff, 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 she was going to, she was going to speak. No, no, you go ahead, Cliff. You got it. She knows me well. She yeah, knows go ahead, Cliff. You got it. You got that's it. That's all. I just want to make sure that you all knew what the, the, no, the ahead, decision Cliff, she was it. talking about. Yep. It talks about community integration, which I mentioned earlier. Is not really happening with people with disabilities. Go ahead. No, no, you, you got it. You said just what I was going to say. So, I mean, like I was saying, that 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 act has been in here and it's not being enforced. And for those of us with disabilities, we cannot stay in housing on our own and be independent without getting overly supportive. So you're taking us on a bridge where we either can't get support and we'll end up at the point where we're either homeless or at risk to the point where we're almost homeless, or we want to become where we can absolutely not have to rely on paycheck to paycheck and have a regular set income and do well. But most of us that are in that disability range a lot of us can't even stay on that range because we can't get the right supports we have because we have to deal with landlords that don't understand this stuff. We have
have to deal with transportation that's severely lacking. Like I live in a southern Saratoga Clifton Park area. We have, I, I have doctors and, um, and grocery stores and stuff that are all over. I don't have access to great transportation options. A school, a college, I can't even go to school or college because Access VR state agency isn't allowing me to get there. So that, that's also impeding on fair housing and that's where my zip code is in, not intentionally saying that I can't live there because I can't afford it, but also because of my disability. Now am I gonna have to move again because I can't afford there? And am I gonna have to move to another area that's lower quality and do I have to find other barriers and stuff? These are different barriers that you guys might not have been thinking about. But we need to have all these qualities and why do people have to do this? Why are people of color, people with disability, different racial backgrounds, creeds, religions, etc. Why do people have to keep on moving and people in all these other minority backgrounds why do we have to keep on moving and moving? Like we're a ping pong ball around this state. We don't want to live in this state. We want to go to places like Florida and other places. We don't want to live here if we got to run around like a ping pong ball and we can't get the right supports where we live. So I appreciate your comments. There was a lot to unpack in there because there's a lot that we're facing as a community, as a state, in fighting housing discrimination and uh, achieving housing equity. The, um, you know, the, the battle is not yet won. We have organizations here at this table that are you know, doing our best to, on a day-by-day day -day basis, you know, root out discrimination where we see it. We rely on the community to, um, you know, make reports to file complaints with our agencies. We, you know, as Tara talked about, work in coalition. Um, you know, the Division of Human Rights regularly meets with the Office of the Attorney General. We have a civil rights roundtable where we share information, we share case uh, data, trends, educational programming that we that we offer. Um, to the community, but there's no doubt that there's more to be done and that advocates uh, are our partners in you know, holding us accountable as agencies, pointing out our blind spots and you know, suggesting other places for us to, to step up and, in, and increase enforcement. So you know, I really appreciate your, your voice, your attendance here today, everyone's voice and attendance here today. And I'm, I'm going to do the closing remarks, if that wasn't already just it, um, <laughs> unless someone else wants to just one last thing. I, I, I would, if you don't mind, um, because sure. I, I wanted to acknowledge what Cliff had said, because I think it was in, in part directed to something I said, and I, as part of being held accountable, I'd like to issue my apology when I use the term suffering. In, in my head, I meant it as suffering without the accommodation, suffering without the accessibility. Because in my head, that's when people are coming to me, they're coming to me with problems. And it's my job to help solve those problems. Um, but I acknowledge that that was not the right way to phrase that. And, I, and again, I issue an apology. And for that, that's, I think, again, a part of the important work of people who do this, uh, community lawyering, state agencies, people who are dedicated to this type of work, um, building coalitions. And that coalition has to include people from the community, people who live through these experiences. It's not for us to interpret someone's life through how we think it should be. We, I shouldn't be interpreting what I think your problems are. People should be, I should be engaged with them so people feel that this is a safe place for them to come tell us their problems and for us to try to work to see how we can solve that both on an individual basis and then at least in my agency, because there is a limit to how much I have control over what New York State does, um, to raise those voices up to other partners who hopefully can do bigger projects. Okay, so I think, um, 
with that, I will thank everyone for participating. I'll thank our panelists for joining us this afternoon. And I will wish you all a fair housing month. Every month is fair housing month of the division. And we look to you as partners in rooting out housing discrimination. Thank you so much. Don't forget to sign out if you need, if you want CLE and hand back in the um, evaluation and the affirmation.